Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Comic Boom Comic Source collaboration. This is your DC Spotlight for the week of January 23rd, 2024. I thought it was an okay week. I don't think anything really stood out as being, oh my God, that was so good. But I don't think anything was, you know, stood out as, oh my God, that was terrible either. So just kind of a an average week, I guess. Uh, I don't know. What do you think, Rob? Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess. Uh, nothing really, uh, nothing really stood out to me. There's a, you know, maybe some interesting developments in detective comics, which we'll talk about, which I thought were kind of, kind of interesting and a, a fun issue for Power Girl. And, uh, you know, maybe Brave and Bold had some had interesting ending for Tom King's uh, uh, remake of the first issue of Batman, or the first, first altercation between Batman and the Joker. But, um, but we'll, we'll get into it. We'll talk about it. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's good, a good point. point. I just wonder if, you know, um, was this three years we've been doing this now? If, if, and, you know, we're both longtime DC readers. If At some point, it just starts to feel like the same old thing, you know? Like even those interesting developments you talk about, you know, it's just, okay, what's DC doing this week? Well, they're slightly tweaking Batman's origin or Batman's first encounter with the Joker or whatever. It's like, how many times have they have they done that? You know, like these characters that have been around decades and decades. Um, it's like, what story hasn't been told at this point? And, and there's a lot of curiosity because for those that aren't aware uh, in another couple of years, three or four years, Superman and Batman are going to be in the public domain. The way Mickey Mouse is the steamboat Willie version of Mickey Mouse. The very first version of Mickey Mouse uh, is and that's why there's going to be some Mickey Mouse horror movies coming up this year because uh, for those who aren't aware of the way copyright law works in the United States you can only have the exclusive uh, rights to that character to that IP for a hundred years after a hundred years uh, or it might be 90 years actually now that I think about it um, but yeah after a certain period of time anybody can can write stories anybody uh, and, and keep in mind, copyright is not the same as trademark, right? Like trademark, that's going to refer to a logo or the actual title. Um, so, you know, it's not like somebody's going to put out a, a, a movie and call it Superman or call it Batman. They're not going to get a, be able to get away with that. But they can have a character that's called Superman that looks exactly like Superman in a movie that they that they create. So, man, what's going to happen then? Who knows? Uh, it's going to be interesting times for sure. Yeah. Um, so anyway, let's go ahead and get started with, uh, the books individually this week, uh, starting with the flash number five top priority, uh, written by Simon Spurrier art by Mike Diodato colors by Trish Mulvihill letters by Hassan Otsman Elhow. I'll give my, um, semi-regular rant here about the letters page or the, uh, I guess the title page we should say. I'm going to complain about two things. I've complained about them before. First of all, page 11 and 12. Page 11 and 12 are the the title page, are the page that has the credits, right? So first of all, you're wasting two pages. The story for it being The Flash, Simon Spurrier, you're moving around, along at a glacial pace. A glacial pace. We still have no answers. We're still not even 100% sure what's going on. It's a bit of a mess. Uh, I'm just going to, you know, I, I typically don't do this. I try to stay positive, but this is just bad. It's just bad. Uh, it, it's not a good, you know how sometimes you get a creative teams together and they just gel and everything works. This is sort of the exact opposite of that. Uh, it feels very discordant, you know, like, uh, somebody's playing a piano and somebody else is playing that's out of tune and somebody else is playing, uh, a guitar and the guitar might be in tune, but the piano's not in tune, but they're playing at, at you know, in different keys or at a different pace, dif different rhythm. And it just, it's, it's, it doesn't feel good. It's uncomfortable to listen to. This is uncomfortable to read. Uh, it, like I said, moving at a snail's pace, we've had no answers. Uh, the art, you know, again, I've talked about Diodato with this new style. It, I like the new style. I don't necessarily think it's uh, the right choice for Flash. I don't feel like it conveys movement that well, uh, which I feel like you need with Flash. But it does convey the sort of 
esoteric uh, multiversal stuff that's going on. It does that really well because it feels kind of weird and wonky and, and out there. But again, it doesn't jive with the word salad that, that Spurrier is giving us. Um, but to get back to my original point, yeah, 11 and 12, we got to go a third of the way, almost halfway, over a third, not quite halfway in the book before we get the title page. It, I don't like it. And we're wasting two pages of possible storytelling when this thing's already moving along really, really slowly. So I could talk about like some story aspects of it because um, there are some uh, things that are interesting, particularly this um, multiversal pilgrim character that shows up and talks to Jay, Inspector Pilgrim, he's called, and he talks to Jay uh, and he talks about what powers Jay has. And that stuff's sort of interesting. But at the same time, uh, that feels discordant and it feels uncomfortable as well. Like Jay and the whole idea of Flash family, especially coming off the, the Jeremy Adams run where everything was, you know, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, but it felt positive, right? It had that thing, that that word, that magic word that Rocky and I like to use when we talk about DC all the time, hope. You know, it had hope for the future. I've never felt less hopeful for Jay. Like, if anything, this feels like a little bit uh, of a, uh, a supervillain origin, right? Like, he's not understood. Uh, he doesn't fully understand his powers. He can't really talk to anybody in his family, even though they're superheroes. He, he feels isolated and different. He's depressed, and he feels bad about himself. Like, this poor kid, this poor kid who's, whose father loves him, and he worships his father. He worships him, at least at the beginning of this issue. Talks about how much he works, and then toward the end, he's like, "Oh, I kind of see my dad as, you know, not the infallible hero that I uh, thought he was." And and we all learn that as kids, you know, we look at our parents and we think they're the greatest, and you know, our dads can do anything. And then you kind of learn that lesson, but that's not that's not a fun lesson to learn when you realize your parents are mortal. That's not what I go to pick up. Com like I don't go read comics for the angst of this type of thing. I feel so bad for Jay. Like it just. <laughs> You know what? I'm going to stop because, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I, I said I had some, had some positive rent, stuff. And rent, I, rent, I, rent. I, I do think that the, you know, the idea of Jay and his powers being different or what, what have you is interesting. But as a byproduct of that, the poor kid, like, I just feel bad for him. I, this is this is the worst arc of Flash, the worst run of Flash I've read since the long, drawn-out uh, trial of Barry Allen. Uh, which went on, which that wasn't bad. It just lasted way, way too long. And it was, it was very much, you know, of its time back then, even though it had, you know, classic Carmen Infantino art. Um, but, you know, that was back in the early to mid eighties. We're talking like 83, 84, 82, 83, 84. And I'll tell you how long it dragged on or whatever. So yeah, this is the worst flash in what? 45 years, 50 years. It's, oh it's, it's it's awful. It, 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 wow. it's, it, it, it's bad. Wow. It's just bad. I can't. I I don't. Yeah. It's bad. I can't say anything other than that. Don't read it. If you're curious, don't be. It's terrible. Don't don't waste your time. Don't waste your money. It's it's just bad. We're five issues in and and nothing's happened. Like you know what's happened? Something's wrong with the Speed Force. And Jay's powers are different than than the rest of the Speedsters, rest of the Flash family. That's it. I just saved you uh, whatever five times three ninety nine. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I can. I, I have a little bit more. Uh, I have a little bit more of a hopeful uh, review. This is actually my. This is actually my uh, favorite issue so far. And admittedly, it's it had, it's it's finally it's arrived probably too late for a lot of readers because it's already issue five. I there's a part of my uh, my heart and my sentiment that that shares some some of your comments i'm a little bit more hopeful than you uh and and uh, this is what i well i pretty much have to choose to focus on if uh, and i get more enjoyment out of the issue if i do so uh and that is the fact that i i do think that i think that there's aspects of the relationship this this new inspector pilgrim and his conversation with jay west uh, this young kid who's trying to figure out his powers, which are ever changing and have been sort of evolving even since 
post Jeremy Adams run. I think there's elements of fun to be had here. And I like this Inspector Pilgrim. He's well, he's still an unknown quantity, in Inspector Pilgrim. He seems to know more about the future than he lets on. And he, and he basically admits that because there are certain rules that he's got to abide by. And I, I like that. I, I sort of like the mystery that that uh, Cy Spurrier has planted about Jay, about Jay West because he has insane strength. He can ride along and surf along the slipstreams behind other speedsters. He can uh, he doesn't so much teleport, but he can entangle himself with other speedster conduits. And right now he's connected to his father. So uh, because he's he, his father is closest in proximity, he finds himself he he basically can entangle through the speed force into. And, and locate other speedsters, but he hasn't quite figured that out yet. But whenever he gets emotionally and he gets a little fearful, Jay West, that's why Jay West has been sort of appearing where his dad is. And, uh, and of course, the, the, he's, he's, he has the ability, interestingly enough, apparently to shape, to reshape and repurpose this, this steel force almost on instinct, which is very different than what other speedsters can do. Uh, the, as uh, Inspector Pilgrim says, he tells him, he says, you know, he tells him he, that uh, his, he has, uh, most speedsters have a linear, what he calls a linear connection to the speed force. Jay West is a little bit more problematic. Um, I think it's, I think it's interesting. Now, uh, having said all that, it, you know, what's happening so far is you're right. Something's happening with the speed force. We have this uncoiled, these, this, the, the uncoiled seem to be almost like the bad guys that are encouraging a disruption of the speed force. And then we have these, this multiversal police force, or this dimensional police force called the the uh, the the stillness, and they don't want they don't want Barry they don't want Wally West and Mister Terrific to sort of continue to experiment with the Speed Force, and Wally West can it, it, it's clear that whenever the Speed Force is being used, it's causing damage in other others in other dimensions, and so where I think where Cy Spurrier is going with this is that Jay West is going to be the hero at the end of this story. This kid's going to be the hero because he has the ability to reshape and repurpose the speed force. And that might be the Duke Ek Machina ending that will arise in this story because the speed force, because of the damage the speed force is having on other dimensions, somebody's got to reshape and retool it so it causes less damage. And that will likely be Jay West. That's my guess. That seems to be where how I read the narrative going forward. And now having said that, I'm not, you know, it's hard for me to, argue with you when you when you suggest that this storyline is a little bit off the rails and can be a little it, it's got it's it's esoteric and it's got a, it's high degree of word salad but i thought this issue uh was was a little bit better and i and i focused more on jay west's conversation with uh inspector pilgrim and i liked his conversations with wally my criticisms and my frustration is is Jay West wasn't truthful with his dad. Wally West hasn't been truthful with Mr. Terrific. Mr. Terrific hasn't been truthful with Wally West. Everybody is keeping secrets while everyone knows that it's potentially multiversal, universal destroying information that they're not sharing with each other. You know, why isn't Wally West telling Mr. Terrific the truth about what he sees in another dimension and other dimensions? Why isn't Mr. Terrific telling his, sharing all his fears to Wally? Why isn't Jay West being more open and honest with his dad? Although you can maybe cut the kid an excuse because he's just a kid. But there are some sort of forced characterizations here that don't quite feel right. But in the overall context, plot wise, I think the plot's slowly starting to come together. But I fear that a lot of readers may not have the patience to have read this far as, as, as we have. And even if they have, they might share your view that uh, you've, you've sounds like you've given up on it already. Yeah, I mean, we're five issues in and, and I, I've got zero answers. And, and, you know, I'm glad you brought it up that everyone's keeping secrets. I, I, I dislike stories. You know, that's just a personal thing. I dislike stories where that happens. I think it's lazy writing to do that as a, you know, as a, as kind of a plot device. Oh, this bad thing went wrong because character A didn't tell character B what was going on, especially when they're characters like father and son, like Wally and Jay, or they're both superheroes working together like Mr. Terrific and Flash, right? It's like a, an episode of Brady Bunch or Three's Company, right? Like I can describe every single uh, episode of Three's Company to you right now, right? There's a misunderstanding. And why is there a misunderstanding? Because people don't tell each other the truth. That, that's that's just the end of it, right? So I get it. Well, if everybody just opened up and said and, and was truthful, then you wouldn't have any any secrets. You wouldn't have any reason to have the story. Well, again, like then this is not a story worth telling. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you really can solve storytelling problems just by handling something that's like so simple, right? Like 
the whole idea of the the Star Wars uh, to go completely off the rails here, like the first star, <laughs> the first three Star Wars movies, like the whole and and really even the second three, right? Because you could you could uh, make an argument, and, and I think even George Lucas has said this, right? It's really the story of Darth Vader, the story of Anakin Skywalker. Guess what? You could solve the whole thing with you know one simple idea. You just take Anakin aside and you go and you say, "Dude, bros before hoes," and that's it. That's it. Problem solved. Problem solved, right? Like he doesn't go out, you know, save Padma, blah, 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 kill all these people. No. Bros before hoes, dude. Hey, guess what? Wally and Jay and Mr. Trific, whatever, just put all your cards on the table because bad shit's going to happen if you don't. Like these these are it, – it sort of insults the intelligence of the reader and because you're insulting the intelligence of the characters when you don't have them like tell each other what's going on. You can – like you said, you can excuse it with Jay because he's young. I can't excuse it with Wally. I can't excuse it, especially Mr. Terrific. I mean, this guy's supposed to be one of the smartest people in the DCU. He's not going to tell people what's going on. Makes no sense. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's you know, again, it's just bad. I could, I could keep picking it apart about what's the point. I don't waste my time. <laughs> Next time I probably won't even talk about it. I'll just let you talk about it. I, I, I haven't been this, I haven't been this bothered or upset by a run in, in a long time. And I think part of the reason is because there was absolutely no reason to end the previous run. The previous run was selling well. Fans were enjoying it. The writer wanted to stay on. There was no re like this is the stupidest editorial choice, and that's saying something when you're talking about DC because they make editorial stupid editorial decisions all the time. But I think this is the stupidest editorial choice that DC's made. Well, see, I can't. I, I was going to go back to Convergence, but I I can't go that far back. I can only go back. Uh, to night terrors, right? like <laughs> I don't know if you, I don't know, Rock, if you've been, yeah, have yeah, been uh, reading any of the articles that came out about kind of the year-end wrap-up for retailers. There's a number of sites that did them. Comics Beat did one, Sketch did one. Can't remember. There's another one I read. To yeah. a man, to a man, every retailer railed against night terrors about how it took the momentum away from Dawn of DC that was selling well and didn't sell and it was horrible and. Whatever. So, yeah, this is the worst choice since Night Terrors, and it kind of spins out of Night Terrors. Before that, I think you got to go back to like Convergence, uh, and and I maybe I'm just forgetting, uh, or I'm blocking it out. But yeah, it, it, this is just awful. I can't say like normally it's like man, I run out of ways to describe how good something is. I've run out of ways to describe how bad this is. That, that's how bad it is. It's, it's, wow. it's awful. It's I, I don't. Awful. I I want to be clear. I don't. It's uh, while I'm I disappointed I, it's not that bad on my level of, of badness this flash run it's challenging me to be honest the highest compliment i can give the flash is there were times at the beginning of ram v's detective comics run where i was very critical uh but i see the beginnings of i'm beginning to catch on to the plot now and i'm hoping that Spirier will keep will turn me around the, the more issues we get into the flash albeit we're at issue five but better late than never so that's that's the most optimistic thing i can say and my fingers are crossed so hey i'll be happy to eat my words i'll be happy to eat my words but i just don't like he yeah every issue is worse than the, than the previous and, and that, you know it's not 100 percent true this isn't the worst issue because there are those interesting aspects about jay that you mentioned but they come along with the other stuff i was talking about they were they're depressing and okay i gotta tell a good story i'm gonna put this little kid through hell basically you know like it, it was problematic right from the beginning he's he's down in the dark basement of the school uh you know all alone and depressed whatever and i'm not gonna name yeah. any names but i know other creators that yeah. that looked at that looked at that issue with jay down in the basement and, and they were like wtf man what is he doing? Like, what are you doing to this poor kid? I, I, I feel like saying one other thing, too, that uh, uh, DC continues to struggle with the ages of all the legacy heroes. Oh, yeah. uh, Jay, Jay here seems to be, what, eight, nine, ten years old? And yet in the Titans Beast World uh, Central City issue, he's 14 or 15 dating, dating, yep. assist, dating uh, animal girl. Yeah. Uh, uh, so exactly. it, there seems to be an inconsistency as you know, how old are these kids? DC is so desperate to age up everybody. And I don't know what the hell they're going to do if we get up with this ultimate DC universe by the end of the year, which maybe we'll talk about near the end, all the rumors and innuendo coming out, what DC is, where DC is headed for 2024. But it, uh, everything is just wonky in terms of age wise for the new legacy heroes. They're, 
uh, there seems to be very little consistency from writer to writer. It's like they're told different things. But uh, in any event, that's a side comment. Yeah, and I know Cy Spurrier doesn't listen. Well, he might listen to the show. I don't know. If, if he does <laughs> listen, I'm sure he's turned this episode off by now. Um, but but if, if in some way, you know, I can get any message to Cy Spurrier, it's leave poor Jay West alone. Don't turn him into a villain. This feels like such a supervillain origin to me. Just leave the poor kid alone. You want to mess with a, a kid, turn him into a villain, go go write Damian Wayne. Leave poor Jay West alone. And for that matter, leave Wally alone too. Because, I mean, can you imagine after everything yeah. DC has put Wally through, now they're going to turn it, they're going to, you know, pull a, a James Gordon on, well, they're, they're going to turn well, <laughs> his son into a villain? Well, we don't know that. I actually think they're making him to be the hero of the story is where I think they're going with this. Because the only person that can it, fix what's wrong with the Speed Force is probably going to be Jay West because he can reshape it. That's my guess. But again, I might be I'm wrong. Not Maybe you're right. gonna, I'm not saying he's going to turn him into a villain in this story. <laughs> but he's... he. And it might not even be him. It'll be somebody else that comes along going, oh, remember all that angsty stuff that Cy Spurrier did to Jay, uh, Jay West? That that's a, that had to scar him. And it'll be you know five years down the line where somebody comes along, some some yeah. some writer we've never even heard of who hasn't even written a, a comic. Well, it could be worse. He, he, he could be on, in a volcano on Earth-3 terrorized by Ultraman for seven years. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> that's that's exactly my point. You, you do something stupid like that, and you're laying the groundwork for somebody else to come along later and go, hmm, I got a great idea. This has never been done before. Let's turn the superpower having uh, uh, offspring, son, daughter, whatever, of a, a, a beloved DC character into a villain. And look, I got the I got the origin and the reasons why right here. Look at him hiding in the school basement. Look at all this crap he had to put up with. And Look at all these feelings of angst, blah, blah, blah. It's like, man, you know, I, there should be, DC should just have a rule for Wally West. Is that you, he, Wally has suffered enough. It's like Marvel with Daredevil, right? Like they, they only seem to be happy when they get pitches for these characters where they're just fucking them over constantly. They're never allowed to be happy. Well, Matt Murdock Joshua is Williams never, ever, Joshua. ever allowed to be happy. Ever, yeah. ever. We had we had a happy flash run, and and you know I know the argument. Well, there has to be drama, there has to be tension, there has to be ups and downs, and I get all that, right? But we had that we had that with Jeremy Adams, but it still had this underlying feeling of hope, and it was it was happy and it made you smile. And you, I mean, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, like I said, but it wasn't this dark. I'm laying the groundwork for Jay West to be a villain. Anyway, I really am moving on. I promise. Uh, up next, we have Titans Beast World Tour, Star City number one. <clears throat> um, there's multiple stories in this one, um, but it, it's kind of this through this throughput. So, so it starts off with the story like Father. It's written by Joshua Williamson. Art is by Jamal Campbell. Letters by Troy Petrie. Um, and, and that's basically telling the story of uh, Connor Hawk and Oliver Queen and their fighting against these uh, these two mad scientist twins who are using the spores to run a bunch of the the uh, um, beast boy the garo spores so they've dug up a bunch of bodies they've infected the corpses with the garo spores and now they're trying to figure out how to control these monsters that, that they've created so that story is told from the perspective of oliver queen and it ends on a little bit of a cliffhanger and we're told to be continued in this very issue, which I thought was an interesting choice, I guess. And then we jump to a uh, Red Canary, Black Canary story called Birds of a Feather, which is written by Ryan Parrott. Roger Cruz is the artist. Adriana Lucas on colors. Wes Abbott on letters. Um, and, and, and yeah, I mean, it's kind of a run-of-the-mill story here. You got Black Canary. You got Red Canary. They're trying to save people from hurting themselves and trying to capture a bunch of the people infected by the Garo spores and does show a little bit of, uh, of red canaries inexperience. Um, and it shows black canary getting turned in, uh, getting infected, getting turned into a monstrous animal. Of course it's a canary. Um, but it, it's kind of hopeful. It does the, uh, it does the job. It feels very, very DC, if you will. Uh, and the art's pretty solid. Uh, although not as good as I've seen Roger Cruz, like not, not, not as, uh, 
not as good as the art we saw in his uh, Robin series. And then after that, you've got a Robert Venditti story with art by Gavin Goodry, colors by Alex Guermas, letters by Steve Wands. That's uh, the Jungle Society of America, right? Like we had the Jurassic League. Now we've got the Jungle Society of America. And you've basically got Jay Garrick Flash and, um, and Alan Scott Green Lantern. And they're infected by the spores. And we've got uh, Huntress. And this is the Huntress that came uh, back in time at the beginning of Justice Society uh, from, you know, different multiverse and Stargirl and Red Arrow. And they're having to take on these very, I mean, what could be argued as the two most powerful members of the Justice Society. And then after that story, then, yes, we do indeed go back to uh, the first story that we had to start. And uh, this one is... Uh, Story and art by Brant and Stein, who are two comic creators who work together all the time. Letters by Frank Savitovic. Uh, and it tells the second half of that story. But what's interesting is when we got the first half of the story from Joshua Williamson, it was told from the perspective of Oliver Queen. When Brant and Stein give us a conclusion of the story, it's uh, from the perspective of, uh, of Connor Hawk, right? So we get to see um, them in the midst of this adventure. And in the first story, uh, Oliver Queen is worried about his relationship. He doesn't seem to be able to sit down and really have that heart to heart with Connor uh, that he feels he needs to. And now we're getting the other side and Connor's sort of feeling the same way. Um, so it, it's interesting as far as the story goes, again, it's, it's nothing special. It's paint by the numbers as these anthologies sort of are. Um, I, and, and the art's really strong and I appreciate the style and the storytelling. I wish the colors were a little brighter um, to make it feel a little more traditionally super heroic. Um, because I feel like the colors are right, um, as opposed to colors for the Jamal Campbell art in uh, the first story. I mean, he's coloring, his, but they're much brighter and more, more vibrant. And so it, it has a little bit of a feel. Uh, I get it. It doesn't look exactly the same as a different artist, uh, and it is a different perspective of the same adventure. Uh, you know, being told from, from you know one side from all the queens, I from rock, but yeah, just wish those colors were a little better. I think it worked a little better. But anyway, uh, what are your thoughts on these what, four ways? Uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. Go ahead. No. I, uh, yeah, I, yeah. There, there's not much to say in this issue. This is another, uh, frankly, I mean, I, it's it's contribution to the main story of Beast World is, I mean, it's I guess. If you're a huge Green Arrow fan, and if you like Green Arrow's relationship with his uh, son Connor, I guess there's well, there's not really much development there. It's the same old, same old. They they don't really seem to connect very well, but they but they finally do at the end, and they're gonna have they're gonna go and have further talks with each other and everything else. Um, um, I actually think that I, I would have I don't know. I wish I wish there was I wish these times would have more relevance. And, plot wise or just be more exciting because they just aren't they, they they aren't exciting at all to me and i just and this it's this very one note characterization and and i mean how do you how do you make uh, green arrow's relationship with connor interesting anyway it's not interesting it just isn't i mean and and frankly i mean oliver queen was an asshole father you know news at 11 so what but now trying to are trying to make him a nice guy why <laughs> leave him a jerk uh, let it be dysfunctional. Uh, focus on the plot. I, I, I don't know, but it's it, this is a significant miss for me. We got these new characters, resur these resurrection twins, which are okay. I guess that's sort of quasi interesting. I guess. I just, I, I just, I don't find it all that interesting. And uh, Red Canary. In case I wasn't, uh, in case people weren't bored to death about this new character, Red Canary, to begin with, who has the worst origin, I think, in the history of DC Comics. Uh, of course, am I engaging in hyperbole? I don't know, actually. Uh, this is a woman, uh, Red Canary, who gained, who became, decided to become a superhero when she was at the, she has a brown belt in karate and she's buying a guitar in a guitar shop. It's being robbed and she stops the robber and, and then she decides to become Red Canary and, and then she happens to walk up to Bla Black Canary and Black Canary decides that she's going to 
She's going to take on a new Robin-like character. Absolutely asinine origin. But now this is a, another vain attempt to, made Ray, to make Red Canary relevant. So she's walking around in these torn red tights, which, you know, you think she's a hooker working off Fifth Avenue or something. But, you know, she's a superhero. And, uh, you know, she's, and this is her coming in, coming into her own, you know, and, and Black Canary scolding her and what she's doing. I mean, it, it's kind of comical, and I'm kind of being a dick when I'm talking about it. But um, I just... I just, I, I wish the character was more interesting, but Red Canary is not an interesting character. And w why does she exist? She, there's no reason for her to exist other than to give more royalty checks to Joshua Williamson, who came up with this uninteresting character. We, ha we have Sin. Sin is being rescued from Themyscira in the pages of Birds of Prey by Black Canary. She's an infinitely more interesting character with a history. Red Canary is a redundancy, and if you want evidence of that, all you got to do is waste the money of the cover price of this particular comic. I don't recommend that people buy this comic. Uh, the backup is the Jungle Society of America. Again, wasted, unnecessary, superfluous. I don't. I don't find it to be a contribution. None of these. Uh, none of these tie-in issues are necessary to enjoy Beast World. They take away from it in my mind, uh, and I. I don't think they enhance the narrative at all uh, because. Um, they just are. I've, I've, they're, they're not on my pull list, and, and it, but we get, we're get. we fortunate enough that we can read these things in advance, but boy, oh boy, am I ever glad we can because that's one of the reasons why they're not on my pull list uh, is because uh, there's just there's just nothing here. Unless speculator alert, you know, we got the resurrection twins, you know, uh, but he, even the introduction of new villains in these types of uh, issues just seems so ridiculously underwhelming that all of a sudden we have these resurrection twins. Sounds like a cool name, but all of a sudden they, they just exist. It's sort of like Red Canary. Suddenly a character just exists. No organic development, no slow build of an origin of a villain or whatever. I don't know. It just seems uh, frustrating to me. You know, bring on the ultimate DC universe, <clears throat> if there is one. But, uh, <laughs> oh, rumors. Oh, yeah. rumors. Uh, all right. Up next, we have Detective Comics number 1081 from writer Rom V. Ricardo Federici and Stefano Raphael are the artists. Oh. Lee Luffridge on colors, ta uh, Tom Napolitano on letters. Um, yeah, this is uh, the strength here is the, the art. Uh, the art is just gorgeous from Ricardo Federici. Uh, you know, mo like we've talked about it before. A lot of people only view him as. Um, kind of a cover artist but he's a very uh, strong storyteller um i i will say that uh, i don't i'm not a fan of the grant morrison run of batman you know you talk about creating a bunch of characters uh but but writers uh, you know these care uh, the writers the creators nowadays they sure like to go back and it's not that far back that morrison was on it you know it was maybe uh 15 years ago you know um i mean he he was actually I, th I want to say, no, I guess, I guess what the new 52 was when he came off, but that was 2011. So, yeah. So, you know, 15 to 20 years ago, you know, Morrison's Batman or whatever, not that long ago, but he created a bunch of characters and, you know, we've seen, um, or he brought characters from the golden age kind of back, uh, in the, into the four, you know, in, into modern times like Zurina, uh, like, you know, the, the character we have show up here, Dr. Dr. Hurt, is it Dr. Hurt? Yeah, I want to say Dr. Yeah. Payne, but yeah, Dr. Hurt. Um, you know, again, somebody way back in the day from the Golden Age that he he brought um, to the fore, and now I guess, you know, there are a lot of creators that love that Morrison run uh, and, and think Morrison's just uh, the, the bee's knees, and so they're going to go and mine that stuff, and, you know, that's fine. Um, I didn't lose any um, interest in the story, or it, it wasn't worse for having this Dr. Uh, Dr. Hurt in here. Um, it, but it is a little esoteric and it is a little, uh, okay, slow paced. I get that. Um, but it's enjoyable. And, and for me, the biggest thing is the, is the art. The art is just so fantastic. I almost don't care what's happening in the story because I just get to look at this gorgeous art from, uh, from Federici. Interspersed in this, and, and, and here's the thing, right? Like this is a perfect example of why you don't need backups. It's a perfect example. So in, in, I feel like in the past, this would have been a backup story with the question going around and, and um, doing an investigation and trying to find out who killed um, you know, one of her detectives because uh, the questions were named Montoya, the commissioner of, uh, of Gotham City Police Department. Um, 
And so she's going around. She, she feels bad. She ordered this detective to go and do something. The detective didn't want to do it. He knew it was dangerous, you know, but he followed orders and he got killed. And so she feels guilty. Uh, and so rather than having this as the backup story, it ties in with what's going on with the main story. So why not just every couple pages, we check in on the question. It's great. It's perfect. This is how it should be. This is how comics used to be back in the day when you had, you know, plot A, subplot B, subplot C. It's the way it should be. The problem is a lot of times these backups are so superfluous and so not needed and don't have anything at all to do with the main story. There's no reason to have it in there. You know, you, you would just be confusing people. What, you know, if you turn the page and it was this completely different story that didn't have anything to do with it. So my argument would be, well, then don't have it in the book if it doesn't have anything to do with it. This is not an anthology title. This is Detective Comics. So, uh, but that's not the case here. It is Renee Montoya um, searching around. Those are the pages that are by Raphael as opposed to Federici. Uh, selfishly, I wish they'd all been done by Federici. But uh, just his style, you can tell it's you know super detailed and, and really interesting. And it must take him a really, really long time, which is why uh, he probably doesn't do uh, you know, monthly book interiors or what have you. So I, I'm curious to see how Batman comes out of the other side of this. It does feel like we're finally getting to the end game um, of Rom V's detective run. It still feels very dreary and kind of depressing, but it's Batman. And I guess it's okay for Batman to feel like that at times. Um, but this has been a hot and cold run for me. There's times I've liked it. There's been the majority of the time, I would say, probably 60% of the time where I haven't enjoyed it, where it just feels like it's going on and on and on. Uh, or we uh, had, a, we've had extended issues at times where Batman feels like a guest star in his own book. He barely shows up at all. At least that's not the case here. It's a very Batman centric book. And uh, again, the art for me makes this one worth the price of admission. So I'm curious to see how it all wraps up. It's not just excitement for this to be done and, for Batman, for Detective Comics, the title itself to get back to feeling more traditionally superhero, um, I am anticipating that. Don't get me wrong, but I'm I, I have anticipation for how this is all gonna gonna wrap up. Um, I have a feeling it might, this may, might be one of those extended Batman runs where it's just sort of forgotten after it's done. Like people don't really go back and mine it for much, if anything. Um, in that way, not so dissimilar from. The way Detective Comics was uh, for Rebirth, when uh, they basically turned it into a Bat family book and, and Batwoman was the main star. James Tynan wrote that. There's a lot of interesting um, story points and character stuff. Clayface being a good guy and whatnot. There was a lot of that on that in that run. Nobody ever references any of it. So I have a feeling it's going to be the same way with, with this. So anyway, what are your thoughts on it, Rocky? Uh well, I, I think uh, I think that this his arc ends in issue one thousand eighty nine. I think it's his final issue. This is one thousand eighty one, so we still have another eight issues after this. So it's it's going to be a while before we get an ending to this story, if that's if that's true. Uh, but in in any event, uh, which incidentally would take it to the end of August, and September is the rumored big change what DC might be doing with a new kind of universe. But in any event. Uh, uh, that's all rumor and innuendo. But for those who love DC, you know what? Google DC rumor ultimate universe. You, man, you might get, get, get some interesting articles and can speculate yourself. In any event, uh, this is Talia Gall. We know Batman was almost he was hung. He was hanged, and frankly, I almost frankly successfully hanged by uh, by the Orgum family. But the, Selina Kyle, Catwoman, rescued him. Uh, in with the help of Commissioner Gordon and, a, and a, her own crew that she put together, and she gave Batman uh, uh, to Talia, who's taken his body into the desert and fed Batman some tea that's causing him to hallucinate. And, and during his hallucination, he's talking to this Doctor Hurt character, which is a Grant Morrison character, and this Doctor Hurt character also has a sort of an sort of an interesting origin tale. I think it, that's also contained in this issue. Now. What exactly does Dr. Hurt, the conversation that Batman has or hallucinates he's having with Dr. Hurt, not really sure what it is. I'm not really sure if Dr. Hurt is sort of the embodiment of the devil. I can't remember the Grant Morrison story with Dr. Hurt anyway, so I'm not sure what exactly Dr. Hurt's supposed to be. But uh, it leads to my, uh, to get right to my favorite part of the comic, and that is the end. 
the art uh, Federico. Uh, what's that? <laughs> Your favorite part of the comic when it was over. Yeah, well, no, I, the, 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 the final story, the final story written by Dan Waters, uh, which okay. is basically the origin of uh, this, doc, well, I'm calling it the origin of Dr. Hurt. I'm, I'm sure that's already been done by Morrison, but this is a new maybe spin on Dr. Hurt that Dr. Hurt was involved. There's this help group that is put together and everyone, the person who put together all these people that are talking about their problems in this, in this sort of like self-help group, all of their problems stemmed from something that Dr. Hurt did to them. It, it, whether he was known as Master Hurt or, or Simon Hurt, or whether he was a husband that screwed over his wife, pretended to be, you know, pretended to be, uh, to have a house, pretended to be married, faked the marriage, faked his identity. Uh, he tricked one, he trained one person for two years to become a soup, sort of like a superhero, very acrobatic and then gave him gave him a grappling hook with no rope attached and he and trained him for years only for the guy to get injured and uh, this this these individuals have all been manipulated very cruelly by this dr hurt and you get a sense of the depth of the evil and the malevolency of dr hurt that he will sp he's so patient he'll spend years befriending you only to destroy you at the 11th hour and then disappear from your life that's what this dr hurt does and this is the same character that batman is hallucinating about in the desert as he's trying to find his way back to mental s stability so he can return to gotham and and defeat the Orgham family. So it's interesting here. And, and, and you, you talked about how it, you talked about how even backup with something's been done different in this issue, the backup involving the question, normally that would be a backup that was literally in the backup, but it's sort of been infused in the middle of the story. Whereas Renee Montoya investigating the, the, the killing of one of the detectives that she sent to try to uh, find out more information about uh, the location of the Batman during the middle of Ram V's run uh, and have only to have it overlap with while the question's doing that, her investigations will ultimately lead her, I'm sure, to the Orgham family just at a time when Batman returns from his hallucinatory conversation here with Dr. Hurt. And I think that Dr. Hurt himself has his own machinations and maybe many of these people that are part of this self-help group uh, this side story that Dan Waters is talking about will sort of elevate the story and give us more information about Dr. Hurt, more information than perhaps was provided by, by Grant Morrison when, that, when the character was originally envisioned by him. So, I, again, I'm invested in this. It's, I, I, I welcome the challenge here. I mean, I... Uh, I, I'm always, I feel like a card, like a cardiogram or what do you got? Cardiograph. So I'm, I'm up and down and up and down. I rant, I rave, I rant, I rave. I bitch, whine and complain. And then all of a sudden I give a compliment, you know, every time then I get upset with DC and then stories like this, I admit, they kind of pull me back, you know? So I, I, what I like about Ram V is that he, he doesn't, he, he challenges the reader's intelligence and so does Cy Spirier. He challenges the reader's intelligence. And uh, now to, for good or ilk, okay, there's a good and a bad side to that. But then we get, we get into issues like Harley Quinn, which we'll review this week, where I feel my, ins my intelligence is being insulted. And so we get extremes with DC Comics right now, and I find it so frustrating. We get the whole spectrum of insulting the reader's intelligence to challenging the reader's intelligence, perhaps too much, to throwing a bunch of esoteric stuff at us, to maybe giving us silliness. And there's a little bit of everything for everybody. And so I think maybe the, uh, I think you and I, Jace, I think in some sense we punish ourselves by reviewing everything or attempting to because I don't think everything is really written for us. And sometimes I got to remind myself that DC, being a large publishing company, uh, they're trying uh, maybe to cater to many different viewpoints and, 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 and sensibilities. Uh, because they don't all hit with me, but this Detective Comics does hit with me, and I'm enjoying it, and I'm really curious to know this Dr. Hurt. I'm, I'm interested to in know more about him uh, now that we've been sort of re reintroduced to him uh, f from Grant Morrison. Yeah, I wasn't about to go back and read the Grant Morrison, Dr. Hurt issues, because yeah. knowing Morrison, it spreads out quite a bit. But, but you know, I, I was curious. I, so, I mean, I Googled it. I was like, Dr. Hurt, DC Comics. That's when I found out. Yeah, Morrison was the one that pulled him from the Golden Age. When he showed up the first time, he his name is Thomas Wayne. He looks like Batman's father, but he's like a distant, distant cousin, apparently, that just has the same name. When, uh -huh. And when he showed up the first time, way back in the Golden Age, I think it was, he wasn't necessarily a – he was this mysterious figure. He wasn't really a bad guy. He wasn't really a good guy, whatever. 
you know, right up Morrison's alley, right? Like how much more Morrison, Morrisonian can you be? Uh, <laughs> and, and so he brought him into his run and yeah, it was never really clear. There was hints that maybe he was the devil. Mama says he's the devil. Uh, <laughs> maybe he was, he was Barbados, you know, Barbados is human form. Uh, like, I, you know, again, very, uh, like Grant Morrison to, you know, introduce this character have him in all these stories and never give any, any real answers. So, you know, ha having gone back and looked at that, my, my thought is if this is sort of the, like the idea I like the best uh, is like, I want to think of him as, okay, this is Barbados in human, in human form, right? Barbados being this bat God slash demon that supposedly is in some way an ancestor of Batman. So it, it kind of dovetails into what doc, Dr. Hertz. I like that idea. I don't know if, if Ron V is going to make that more obvious or head in that direction or not. So yeah, I guess we'll see, but I forgot to mention the Hayden Sherman art in the backup is really fantastic as well. Um, and yeah, obviously it hints at uh, sort of the MO of, of Dr. Hurt, how he plays the long game, which is, uh, which is kind of interesting. So, uh, all right, up next, we have the uh, penultimate issue of Titans beast world. Only one issue left after this. So this is issue five. Tom Taylor's the writer. Yvonne Ruiz, Eduardo Pansica on pencils. Danny Mickey and Julio Ferreira on inks. Brad Anderson on colors. Wes Abbott handling the letters. What do you think of this, Rocky? I, It's okay. It's all right. It's it's still better than the big than, than Night Terrors. And it's better than the two previous DC events. Um, and... There, there, there's, there, there's the big revelation in this issue, I think, is, uh, well, I think that's, that's the big revelation. Now, how big a revelation it is, well, I guess I'm sure will vary from reader to reader. Um, I actually think uh, it, actually, it, it actually caught me by surprise. And in hindsight, it shouldn't have because it almost seems so obvious, <laughs> the revelation on the one hand. But I think... Uh, for me, uh, look, I mean, sometimes I'm surprised and I was, I was pleasantly surprised. And that is the, the revelation that of, of, of who Dr. Hate is. Now, Tom Taylor uh, used a, a, a very obvious form of misdirection that I maybe should have caught on to. And I just assumed Dr. Hate was a man because it was a doctor and hate and he, he looked and was drawn drawn like looking like a male figure but it's not it's a it, it's a female character and it's revealed to be dr hate spoiler alert ends up being revealed to be uh the soul self the evil soul self of raven uh that the darker half of raven and uh i thought that was interesting that that revelation comes near the end because the, the substance of the issue, the bulk of the issue, involves a debate and sort of an argument between Nightwing and Amanda Waller. And Amanda Waller in full a-hole glory, you know, basically threatening the heroes, telling them she's, you know, she's, she's manipulated the world, uh, cyborg, the, in, order, in order to stop the... Uh, uh, Amanda Waller uses her influence over the president of the United States because she seems to be able to have complete influence over the, over the president of the United States. Incidentally, so does the sovereign have influence over the United States. Who's got more power, the sovereign in Wonder Woman or Amanda Waller? Don't know. Just flowing that out there. Don't know. Maybe they're buddies. But in any event, um, it, it's interesting that Amanda Waller is, she's about to kill a million people that have been affected by the spores. The, the Titans want to prevent that from happening. In order to do that, Cyborg needs to take over the essentially the, the military industrial complex in order to prevent missiles and weapons being used by the various governments all around the world. Of course, the moment Cyborg does that, it's he's you're, you're obviously you're going to piss off all the governments of the world, and you're going to further the the propaganda that Amanda Waller has been pushing on on the on the at the United Nations in the world, that the heroes are the villains. They're the ones that are at fault for all of this. Uh, and so while that's happening, you know, uh, Raven cuts, comes in, she gets very upset. She takes out her anger, her anger on Amanda Waller. And um, Nightwing takes out uh, Peacemaker. There's a lot of great action sequences here. Uh, kudos, to, uh, kudos to the artist 
to uh, Ivan Ruiz and Eduardo Penseca. I mean, uh, Penseca, they both, they combine their artistic uh, uh, talents to do a really good job on the issue. Visually, I think it flows very well. I didn't, it flows well enough that I didn't really, it, it, I, I, it felt consistent. I felt like I was reading one cohesive, artistically beautifully drawn story. And it did feel like it, it, it was paced well and flowed well. And uh, I, I thought it was a little bit, um, Tom Taylor seems to have this habit lately of, of just somehow just so almost too conveniently wrapping up these, what I, what I would, when I, just when I think the plot is complex, all of a sudden it, it's, it becomes so simple and, and, and it doesn't become complex because Amanda Waller is doing all this manipulating. And yet at the end, I have a unfortunate in, in tendency to believe that it's just going to, at the end, it's just going to be Amanda Waller being defeated and then all is going to be all wrapped up. And, and at the end here, even the revelation that, that, that Raven's, you know, soul self is, is Dr. Hate. Well, that's interesting, I guess, but what's going to come of it? Uh, what's, you know, what, what's going to be the ramifications of that? Now, having read to the end of issue six, like you have, it, it's an interesting ramification uh, of, of what the flow from, uh, what, what, what the outcome will be here, a ramification that will likely play in and have significant ramifications into 2024. So I will say for those uh, and I'm not spoiling anything. I will say that this issue, why I spoiled it, we're not it, we're not spoiling issue six, which is the final issue of Beast World. Other than to say that the ramifications of this event might have more interesting revelations farther down the line, as it pertains to as it pertains to uh, the Titans and the larger DC universe proper. So in that respect, uh, I can. I think that there will be legitimate consequences from this event. As opposed to what Night Terrors was, which was a complete waste of paper, and uh, and <laughs> and so at least we're going to get that. So I didn't. I I enjoyed this issue. I personally was was I was I was surprised by the revelation. I don't know about you. Yeah, I didn't see it coming either. Um, and yeah, I talked about it before. I generally try not to read ahead. It doesn't. I mean, first of all, I feel like it will, whenever I say that, oh yeah, you know, I've read a comic that comes out, you know, a month from now, cause it's already in the, the press preview area. Uh, it's kind of like we're flexing, like we're bragging, like, you know, humble brag. Oh, I have access, blah, blah, blah. You don't. So I don't like to do, I don't like to read ahead so that I, first of all, I feel like it influences my critique of, you know, prior issues. Cause I know what's going to happen. So I try not to do it. Um, and I, and, and yeah, also the whole hum humble brag thing. I don't, I just, I don't like to do it. I like to just kind of read it a couple days before it comes out. Um, but yeah, I mean, credit to Tom Taylor for how interested I was in this story as it was developing. I was like, oh, I gotta, I gotta go read the next one. I gotta go read the next one. Um, and so, yeah, I was, I was, I was curious. I was curious and I went and I checked it out. I also was surprised. I did not expect this to be the demonic version of Raven. I have a mixed feelings about it being that like, okay, interesting. You know, he is writing Titans. This is a Titans of, you know, centric event. So it does make sense to have the villain, you know, have to do with Raven and and obviously with Gar, with Garfield uh, becoming Garo and, and, you know, their relationship. Again, it, it, this makes sense in terms of, hey, where are we going to focus? Is this the year of Raven at DC or, or what have you? And, you know, the Titans, it, it does feel a little bit like, you know, DC is trying to get a little bit of uh, new readership on board with, you know, the Tiny Titans cartoon and Teen Titans Go and whatever. Um, hey, and now, hey, the Titans are the big hitters of the DC universe. Come jump on, join, uh, become a regular comic reader, what have you. So, you know, I don't, I don't begrudge them. Uh, they don't market the right way. No comic book publisher does. None of them even have a marketing budget anymore um, for comics anyway. Uh, but they'll spend millions to market a, a, a movie that comes and goes. But, you know, you get you hook these people on comics and they're reading month after month. But anyway, I want to digress. Uh, so, yeah, it does make sense to uh to have this very um uh, titans focused but you know the other the negative part is you know you had excitement about who this new villain was excitement about you know people trying to pick up the first appearance possibly where it was going to go whatever now now it's like oh it's just raven so it's it, is it even a new character you know what i mean is it even a new character because yeah it, it's not like we haven't seen raven's demonic self before so is anybody going to care about first time she wears a different costume basically um 
so yeah, it's eh, it's kind of wonky, but you know maybe you don't care about that because you're not a speculator, or what or what have you. Um, but it, again, it does go back to something I said earlier, where yeah, but we're still treading on old ground, right? Like I said it before when we talked about the um, was it the world's finest titans? No, it wasn't the world's finest titans. It was when we had it was the four we had the four issue tales of the Teen Titans that had those fantastic Nicholas Scott covers. And, you know, one was focused on Bumblebee and one was focused on Starfire and one was focused on Beast Boy. And the other one was focused on Raven. And the thing that we said about the Raven one, or I said that, that I didn't like about it, because, you know, it was it was fine. It wasn't a bad comic or what have you. But guess who Raven was going up against in that comic, if you recall? Trigon. Yeah. Trigon. Here we go again. Why is it every time we get a Raven story, the villain's got to be Trigon? I get that it's her father, right? Uh, you know, demonic father, human mother. Well, that hasn't been done before. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we tell a solo Raven story and who's she going up against? Trigon. I get that yeah. she has daddy issues. I get it. But there's more to her than the fact that she's Trigon's daughter. And so here we go again with, you know, Tom Taylor going, okay, I'm going to lean into, you know, something that's interesting for the Titans because I write Titans and this is a Titans event. And so what do we do with Raven? Oh, we have her face, her demonic self. Why does she have a demonic self? Because her daughter is, or her father is Trigon. It's just treading over the same old thing over and over. So yeah, I was excited about who Dr. Hate could be. Yeah. And this did yeah. surprise me. I, I, I admit to going, oh, wow, you know, you know, great moment. But then when I stop to think about it, I'm like, yeah, but now the excitement of a new character, or who it could have been is is it's kind of gone, you know. It's not too dissimilar in a lot of ways. Then, uh, what what was the event that we had with uh, Batman and Damien and Deathstroke? Shadow War, right? Isn't that what it was called? Shadow War. Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah, where, yeah, where there was this like uh, Deathstroke imposter, and it was like the big mystery: who was it? Who, who could it be? New villain. Yeah. And it turns out to be fucking Geo Force. Yeah, <laughs> like, ruin, a, ruin a character, ruin not only not a new character, an old character, an old character alike, and you ruined him. Yeah, I mean, obviously, this is a uh, you know already a villainous version of Raven, so yeah. she's not you know, quote unquote ruined, but you you know you got rid of any excitement of a new character and any potential of a new yeah new character. Yeah, not to say that we won't see Doctor yeah. Hate again, but every right. time it's Doctor Hate, then okay, here comes Raven. Oh, by the way, remember her dad's Trigon, and she's got daddy issues. Like I, I'm just, I'm yeah. over it. No, you, you make you make a good point, and and uh, you know the more I think about it, I you've you've almost convinced me on to that way of thinking that yeah, it's, maybe I should be more disappointed because one of the criticisms is that we want the Titans elevated, and who are the what villains are they facing? Well, the villain they're facing is Amanda Waller. Uh, whoop de doo! But mind you, there is a lot at stake, so there's a lot of the stakes are high and Dr. Hate is a cool character, but since Dr. Hate is an aspect of Raven, it still doesn't, it, it almost feels like a cheat. Like you said, it feels yeah, like they're yeah. cheating a bit, you know, and it doesn't quite, quite have the gravitas of a brand new character. Like maybe if, if her soul self was maybe possessed by, I don't know, dark side or possessed by some other justice league villain, I, you know, maybe that's unfair of me to say, but I, I sh you know, it, it makes a lot of sense where you're coming from that this might be a little bit underwhelming to some readers. It's going to be interesting to see how, uh, other than you, you know, you and me, what, what other people might think, uh, regarding this revelation. Yeah. yeah. I just, just like I, I, this is this is this event was so fun in the beginning. Like the stakes were huge, and you know, Gar turning into a Starro, and like the stakes couldn't be bigger. And it feels like as the story's gone along, like if you look at, and I hate to you know compare to, to the Crisis on Infinite Earths because that's like the gold standard when it comes and and a huge sprawling, and it affected everything and you know changed like literally changed the comic industry. But you look at that, the way that story builds, and it went from being smaller to bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, and then, you know, kind of jump-started the, the modern-day continuity of the DC universe, even though it's been shuffled around, you know, since then multiple times. But you look at this story, and it went from being huge in scope, and it's gotten, instead of getting bigger, it's gotten smaller and smaller and felt less important, and the stakes are, are less. And it sort of goes to, back to what you said earlier, where 
it seems complicated when we get these Tom Taylor stories and then they end up wrapping up so simple in a way you can look at it. Well, I really elegant and, and, you know, good writing, but we'll get there when we talk, uh, when I talk about the end of the story, we get to the final issue, about the way things do wrap up and yeah, it, it just, it doesn't, it, it feels reductive is the problem, right? Like you had all this ex excitement and big events happening and then oh, come to find out this is not true or come to find out that's wrapped up really simply. Uh, come to find out Dr. Hate is just Raven's demonic side. Like you, you took all this potential and you just kind of, no, it's really the same old thing. Um, <laughs> that, don't get me wrong. Like I, I do think this is worth reading. The art is fantastic. This is uh, Yvonne Reese's last hurrah with DC, at least for the foreseeable future. Now that he's overdoing Ghost Machine at Image with Jeff Johns. So, you know, him and Eduardo Panseca do a fantastic job. I think, like Rocky said, this is setting up a lot of ramifications for DC going forward, even if they are some of the things we've seen before, you know, uh, Raven fighting against herself, uh, Raven Civil War, if you will, Amanda Waller being a total scumbag villain. I think it's, <laughs> you know, I said it before, like, I think we're finally getting to the point where it's going to be acknowledged by everybody that, hey, she's just another uh, Lex Luthor in a lot of ways. Like, yeah. everybody will know that she's a bad guy and stop treating her like a good guy. Um, so that could that could come of that. And then there are some other things as well that we can't really mention yet because it hasn't really been talked about. But, yeah, they're, they're, it, I will say, unlike like you mentioned, and I'll use the same example, Night Terrors, where it was like, why did I bother reading it? Wait, waste of paper. It wasn't good, even on its own. And uh, nothing's going to come of it, and nobody cares about any of those. I can't even remember the guy. I can't even remember the main name. Insomnia. <laughs> insomnia. Yeah, Insomnia. Nobody cares about Insomnia. Nobody's going to touch him for years and years. Um, like, nobody cares. It didn't matter. There's no, no, no real consequences from it, uh, other than pissing off retailers. Um, but th that I won't say the same thing with Beast World. I think there are going to be consequences. We are going to see things going forward. So, you know, if you do read it, I feel like, you know, you are going to get some something out of it. Uh, first of all, you'll get enjoyment because it's a you know much more enjoyable story than Night Terrors was, and the art's fantastic. And yeah, there will be some ramifications going forward, so we'll have to wait and see how that all plays out. Uh, okay, up next we have the Penguin number six, an unimportant man, part one. Tom King is the writer, uh, Stephen Subic is the artist, Marcelo Maiello on colors, Clayton Cal on letters. The art is really interesting to me. Um, you know, we saw Steven Subic do the art on the um, Riddler Year One. I think that's what it was called. Yeah, Riddler Year One uh, series. That was the uh, mini series about the Riddler. And it was the version of the Riddler from the Batman movie, and it was it was very weird. It was like mixed media art. He was using what looked like photographs at times and like digital capture and what have you. This is this is much more traditional comic book work for him. And it's the first time I've really had a chance to see his style. Uh, not my favorite kind of style, and it's very dreary, especially with the, the coloring. Um, very dark blue and gray or, or these dark uh, or, or sort of washed out yellows and greens and what have you. Um, but it suits the, the story, the tone of the story that's being told. And I also really appreciate that we get multiple people here that are narrating. We get um, uh, whenever the, the background is yellow. Um, we're getting the um, the words of um, God. What's what the heck's the guy's name? Uh, the 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 villain in um, Falcon. Yeah, what? Falcon, the villain yeah. from uh, Batman Begins, yeah. right? Um, so whenever it's it's like yellow greenish background, uh, and we get the yellow text boxes, it's Falcon that's actually uh, narrating the story, and we're getting uh, we're getting his perspective, as it were. And then there's this uh, purple text box sometimes, and the the backgrounds are more kind of grayish. And it's this woman that Oswald Cobblepot is sort of pretending is his stepmom, but but not really. Isn't isn't really a stepmom? So I you know I appreciated that. And then we've got um, when it's just gray uh, for the text boxes. Uh, and more of a more of a gray background and not the bluish gray of, of the woman. It's Batman who's narrating. And then the penguin himself is sort of traveling 
through all these different stories as they're being relayed to us, right? Like Falcone's giving, you know, it's telling us what's going on and we're seeing, you know, him in the story and he's interacting with the penguin and that's where we get the penguin's perspective. Uh, the same thing with the woman, she's up on a roof. She's talking to Oswald Cobblepot. We're privy to her thoughts. We're not privy to Cobblepots. We just, you know, hear what he says to her. And then same thing when Batman goes and teams up with Cobblepot because Cobblepot, you know, reaches out to Batman and says, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm this bartender at, um, at Falcone's club. I can give you information. I can help you take down Falcone. And then when it comes down to time to actually take down Falcone, the penguins, like you know, and, he, and what Batman doesn't realize is that the penguins manipulating him this entire time. And it, and Batman even senses that, Hey, the penguin doesn't really want to give up the big fish. You know, he's giving me all these little fish and I'm getting, I'm climbing up the ladder, but when it comes time to take down Falcone, the penguin sort of pulls back. Batman senses that. And the, the penguin's like, well, what do you expect you to do? I'm going to be out of a job. No one's going to hire me. Look at me sort of thing. And, we find out, and, and I don't know if this had been in canon before, but it's very interesting what King does here. We find out that Batman, you know, with this Wayne fortune, actually gives the Penguin the money to buy the club after Batman takes down Falcone, and, and this is the club that eventually becomes the Iceberg Lounge. So I, I, as far as I know, that's the first time I heard that and knew that. Yeah. Um and yeah, I just I never heard of that cool. either. Like I, I yeah. think I'm not an expert on penguin. I never Googled it or anything, but I can tell you though that I if this is sort of like a new origin for penguin, it's sort of a de facto origin. I like it. I think it's I think it's interesting. It's intriguing. I, I don't mind it at all. I think it's well done. Yeah, yeah. It, it, works it works really, really well. Yeah. And kind of um going along with that idea of making the penguin feel more formidable, more dangerous, and at the end of the day, more evil. When he gets what he wants, you know, after he fools Batman into thinking, hey, help me out. Don't put me out on the street by taking down Falcone. Batman has mercy, gives him money, buys Iceberg Lounge. Because what is what is the Penguin purport to be doing all along when Batman's giving him payments, uh, you know, monetary payments for this information? I, I'm, I got to use the money to take care of, of this old woman that was my foster mother that, you know, is mentally ill and has dementia and what have you. At the end, you know, Penguin thanks her. Hey, thanks. You know, I, you you were useful, he says. And then he fucking pushes her off the roof. <laughs> and he says, oh, he didn't hear what I said. You were useful. He, the Penguin got what he wanted. He doesn't need this woman anymore. Hmm. But So does he just, okay, let bygones be bygones? Like, no, she's a loose end. And he pushes her off the roof. He kills her. Like, yeah, Penguin, he's a scumbag. He's a scumbag and Tom, like Tom Taylor is definitely, you know, upping the ante for Penguin. Like I used to think of the Penguin, I've said this before, as sort of a joke Batman villain, you know, I think of like the Batman uh, 66 show and I think it was, uh, was it Burgess Meredith? No, Burgess Meredith played, yeah, I think it was Burgess Meredith that played him the nyah, 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 with the umbrella and the top hat and the, you know, uh, cigarette with the little cigarette holder. Uh, and just kind of a joke, man. This guy's not a joke anymore. He's pushing old women off roofs and manipulating Batman right to Batman's face. And don't get me wrong. This is Batman early on in his career. I would, I would want to think that, you know, the world's greatest detective wouldn't get, uh, get fooled th that easily now, but you know, the beginning of his career, what have you. So yeah, this is just, it's just really good. And even though this, uh, Steven Subic art is not my favorite style, it does suit the story very well. And I think part of that is the color work. Um, that we get here uh, again with the backgrounds changing, depending on, um, on who's talking. So give a lot of credit to Marcelo Maiello for that as well. Uh, any other thoughts, Rocky? Yeah. It's a, I actually find that uh, there's uh, there's some consistency here between Penguin one bad day, which I, I think was written by, was that John Ridley that wrote that? Penguin yep. one bad day. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah, I think so. so. I, I think there's consistency there and this iteration of, of Penguin by Tom King. It, 
you know, like say the, the penguin feels uh, more terrifying under Tom King's script than 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 I've I've felt the penguin has been written about in in years. It's it's rare that I've ever had this level of respect for penguin as a villain, and this is just this absolutely I think is just brilliant. This is just a great. This could be a one shot story. That's that's the brilliant of this. A lot of these are just one shot stories, and and just how methodically patient, unbelievably patient, penguin is. He, he pretends to give a shit about a woman for months, possibly a year goes by, where he's caring for this woman, uh, all to fool Batman, knowing that Batman is checking out his story and about being a bartender and having access to all this information. And Penguin is, is feeding him information, and he's so patient and patient, and he manipulates Batman himself. And remember that last panel at the end of, of the last panel in Penguin issue one? Where Batman says to Penguin, Penguin, how did you pull this off? And and Penguin and Batman, remember, they're sinking. They're both trapped in the Batmobile and it's sinking in, Bat in Gotham Harbor. And Batman is saying, you know, we don't know how they get there. We don't know how Batman and Penguin end up in that in that Batmobile. But Batman says to him, Penguin, how did you pull this off? Well, we're starting to see just how brilliant through these first six issues so far Penguin is. He's He's putting together a team. He's put together a hell of a team so far. He's he's prepared to even risk his own life by pissing off his ex-wife like he did a couple issues back. He's put, he's put together a powerful team with uh, the, the assassin from last issue and the 4th of July and the uh, earlier issues. Uh, all to get his all to get his power back and and even seeing his origins now as as penguin how he manipulated Batman just to gain a foothold and it was, you know, you know, there it's the Buddhists have an expression, you know, the bucket fills drop by drop. And you never know when your bucket is full, but you never know. All of a sudden you got a full bucket of water and, and it was empty at one point. That that reminds me of the penguin. He's just he's one of those guys, he's he's just he's that he's that fat, he's that four hundred pound fat four foot bartender that people laugh at and point at no one would guess that in a year's time that guy's going to be the owner of the iceberg lounge and one of uh gotham city's most powerful mafiosos tom king is is, is in just six short issues I'm, I'm beginning to see the threads and the strings of just of how that is possible because of how patient oswald copperpot is and just is very very well done very very well done and you know uh, again I'm, I'm i'm enjoying penguin much more than i'm enjoying his wonder woman uh but that's just the nature of tom king he's a divisive writer and uh you know i guess all the power to him but i'm enjoying the hell out of penguin Am I enjoying it more than his Wonder Woman? I don't. I don't think I am. But I, that's not to say that it's not. That's not good. I, I think. I just. In, I just am more of a fan of the character of Wonder Woman, and yeah. the Penguin I can kind of take him or leave him. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. they're that's both really good. good. I'm enjoying. I mean, I'm enjoying both of them. But if I had yeah. to pick well, one, Wonder Woman's where, okay. I'm just saying, a Penguin's just yeah. a little bit. Uh, I think he's just understand. I, in my view, I just I'm enjoying Penguin that much more. We'll see. Yeah, like if I could only keep reading one, I would definitely keep reading Wonder Woman, <laughs> and I would be fine. Even though, well, we don't know how many more issues of Wonder Woman they are. There are going to be um, Penguins twelve issues, so we're what halfway. Uh, okay. Uh, up next, we have Batman: Brave and the Bold. Four stories this week: Batman: The Winning Card Part Four. Tom King is the writer. Mitch Garrods on art and colors. Clayton Callan letters. Wild Dog: Here Comes Trouble Part Three. Written by Kyle Starks, Fernando Passerin on pencils, Eau Claire Albert and Wade Von Grabager handle the inks, Matt Herms on colors, Rob Lee on letters, Aquaman Communion Part 3, Gabriel Hardman, writer and artist, Matt Hollinsworth on colors, Simon Bull on letters, and finally, Nor is the Batman, Bruno Redondo, story and art, Wes Abbott on letters. Uh, <laughs> the first story, um, really interesting, almost a new dynamic new new batman slash joker origin in terms of their um their first encounter and the way it all ends joker has a chance to to kill batman like the batman is is at the joker's mercy conversely there's a point in the story toward the end where the tables are turned and batman could permanently take out the joker uh and alfred is the one that you know he he sort of says well he intimates, he doesn't come right out and say, but he definitely intimates that, yeah, they need each other. Without the Batman, there is no Joker. Without Joker, there is no Batman. So it's it's Tom King sort of saying out loud what 
you know, many writers have hinted at over the years, especially in terms of the, if the Joker could kill Batman, he won't because he needs that kind of opposite side of himself to give his, his life meaning. So as sort of a new updated, you know, first encounter of, of Joker and Batman, I think this works really, really well. And the sort of silent movie aspect of whenever the Joker talks, I think worked really, really well. And the, the visuals from Mitch Garrods, uh, I mean, he, he nails it when it comes to the colors for the moments of the story. Um, you know, when it's, whether it's, you know, dark blues and grays and, and purples with the, the, the bright hit of, of red or green or what have you from the Joker's lips or his hair. Um, or whether it's Bruce Wayne and Alfred, you know, discussing things, uh, they're actually fishing on a lake at the end of the story and there's a brightness to it. Um, but the sun is also going down. And so, you know, that's another part of it. Like this idea that, well, this is only the beginning and the sun is going down, um, Batman and, and things are only going to get darker when it comes to your relationship with the Joker. And maybe, maybe you should have taken the opportunity to take him out. You know, would, I mean, Batman doesn't kill and, and, you know, I get that at least not the modern Batman, but if you think back on all the people and all the harm the Joker's done over the years, if you could go back to that first encounter Batman and, and take him out, would you, I mean, I think it would be hard to argue in the real world, that that wouldn't be something you would do. You know, it's kind of like that, that dilemma, that moral dilemma, that question that's always, I feel like talked about in every uh, philosophy 101 class in college. If you could go back and kill Hitler, would you do it? Uh, Cause I, I mean, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about pure evil. Um, so yeah, uh, this was fantastic. I, I do wish obviously that it came out in a more timely fashion. I understand how hard, Tom King and Mitch Garrett's work on these things. But again, it's up to DC. Like you should have waited until three of these four parts were in the can before you even released the first issue. And that would have given what three months to do the last one. Um, you should have waited DC. You should have waited, but I, I get uh, it. No patience. Uh, nope. You have no patience. So. Yeah. I feel compelled to add that this, this is a story that uh, in the next issue of Batman, when, when that, <laughs> the next few issues of Batman, to come back and read this story, you'll, this story can be read in a different light. Because for Joker Year One, the Joker Year One storyline playing out in, by Chip Sardaski, uh, there's, uh, you know, you can avoid spoilers online, uh, obviously. And, uh, but I can tell you that it's, this is consistent with Chip Sardaski's Joker Year One I believe, uh, for ill or for, for good or ilk. And so it's, it's interesting. I, I, I think that the story itself, I, I think it, it, it does its job. It, it, it as you said, Jace, it, the, this idea that the, the, the Batman and Joker are, are like yin and yang. It's like the black and the white, two sides of a coin, you know, the good and the evil, the good, the bad, and, and what have you. And the fact that they both have an opportunity here to kill each other and they both neither one of them takes it and and i and at the end here I, I love the ending how batman is talking to joker when he's in the cell and they both sort of acknowledge that that reality <laughs> and uh and uh he, he, the joker even at one point calls batman insane and so they they both you know when you think of it when you're if you if you exist on two ends of a spectrum if you've got somebody who's good on one end of a spectrum and someone who's insane and evil on the other end of a spectrum you both might in your own twisted kind of way view the other side as being insane because you're own, you're you're so intractable in your own state of mind and that's sort of like the how the batman and joker how their relationship is uh there's an interesting conversation at the end between brute and uh between a, a fellow billionaire of gotham uh uh this brute character and bruce wayne and uh, you recall in the first issue batman asked as bruce wayne he asked 
he impersonated Brute because he wanted to lure the Joker, and he it actually saved Brute's life. But he wanted to impersonate Brute uh, in Brute's household in in luring the Joker and Brute and, and the, the the manner in which Bruce he he needed to be Bruce Wayne to, to convince Brute to let him sort of take on the role of attracting the Joker. And Brute tells him in this Brute arrogantly can't you know tells Bruce Wayne that you know. Gotham is a city of monsters and who the hell are you? You're just Bruce Wayne, you know, you know, because Brute's ego got the best of him and he wants to put Bruce Wayne in his place because Bruce Wayne isn't isn't like him. And you, you can tell it's this one upmanship between two billionaires of Gotham and the, the last panel sh sh showing uh, the last panel uh, of that page. Uh, showing Bruce Bruce Wayne looking at him, giving him that Batman eye. I thought it was very well done by Mitch Garrard. Just absolutely, uh, just just fantastic. And of course, uh, the the final the final bit where um, uh, the Joker very uh, just the way Tom King ends it. Bat oh my Batman, my Batman, brave and bold. We're gonna have such a grand time together, aren't we? And knowing that's the first time they interact with each other is interesting. But also, knowing Joker Year One and the story that will play out by Chip Sardaski, the Joker Year One, which takes place before this, I think there's consistency between the storylines and that will play out in the pages of Batman. So people, uh, you know, pick up the next uh, story arc in Batman with, by Chip Sardaski. Uh, it, it might cause some wrinkles, cause, but I think it's going to, it's going to, it's, I think it's, it's going to be a very interesting read for everyone uh, who's a fan of Batman and Joker. That would not be me. Not a fan of Batman and Joker. Uh, but that being said, I love Wild Dog. Uh, he shows up so rarely. And the, the Kyle Starks Wild Dog three-parter has been a, a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, and what I love is after Wild Dog got his butt kicked by Gizmo, of all people, uh, last issue, you know, Gizmo, uh, member of the Fearsome Five, traditionally a, a Titans villain, uh, he, he's ready to call it quits. He's like, I don't have any superpowers. I got the crap kicked out of me. What am I doing here? Like, you know, risking my life. Nobody cares. And he, he it's so realistic. Like, he's will, he's ready to give it up. He's ready to quit. He's ready to call it a day uh, and, and, you know, leave the Midwest. And there's nothing there for him. He doesn't need to, to be there. Uh, and then just through circumstances, he ends up at this football game from his old alma mater, Gizmo. Uh, puts a force field around the entire stadium. He threatens to blow everybody up. He's got a bunch of bombs planted throughout the stadium. And again, Wild Dog, uh, he gets ticked off because this is his alma mater. These are his stands. This is where he was a football star. Uh, and, you know, he's like, I ah, used to love to hear the cheer of the crowd. And now that same crowd is screaming in terror. And yeah, he's pissed at Gizmo. Uh, and so he decides that he's going he's gonna to take him out. And he uses... Uh, the weapons that he has on hand and it, it never feels far fetched. You know, it, he was outnumbered the first time it made sense why he got his butt kicked. He's outnumbered here, but it makes sense why he's able to succeed. Basically uses a bunch of smoke bombs and they can't disperse the smoke. Cause again, the, there's a dome over the stadium to keep people from escaping. Uh, so it makes sense. And it, it, it feel not, and not that I'm saying in any way that wild dog is on the same level of Batman. But it's that same idea, right? Like, why is Batman, like, so good, right? Because he plans for everything. He's, you know, four steps ahead or, or what have you. He's got all his weapons and technology, and he's just more prepared and a great uh, tactician. It follows the same, the same idea. Like, Wild Dog wins the day here because he outsmarts them. Yes, they have better weapons, technology, whatever, but... He uses the smoke. He he sneaks up behind him, whacks him, you know, in the back of the head with a bat, so he doesn't have the opportunity. They, the villains don't have the opportunity to use their superior weapons. Like it all makes sense. It's just it's a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, this whole series has felt very realistic. Like it started off with Wild Dog, you know, approaching this uh, like steroid user uh, mob enforcer guy in a diner in the first uh, first or second issue. Uh, and he took him out in a, in a realistic way, even though he was, um, outclassed in terms of, you know, strength level and, and size and what have you, but he, he, he took him out, but he, he took his licks. He took his punches. This is very kind of a street level character. Very realistic. Thought the art was really, really strong as well as the color work. Also very, very good. 
Um, you know, Kyle Starks, the, the voice that he gives wild dog, you know, especially when he's ready to quit, he's like, man, I got, you know, I knock, got knocked down in the dirt. What am I doing? It's such a, uh, just such a visceral and real feeling. So, you know, you add in the Fernando passer and pencils, um, you add in the, uh, color work from Matt Herms and you, you end up with a really, really strong comic. Uh, I, I yeah, I, I, I dug it far and away. My favorite brave and the bold story that we've had of, of any of them that have come out so far. Uh, yep. what do you think of Bucky? I, well, remember, uh, just to remind people that uh, Kyle Starks, uh, did uh, peacemaker tries hard. And I know yep. that in my, in my top 25 DC for 2023, I think I ranked it at number five or six or something like that. Uh, it was just extremely well done a very well written, funny, humorous. He understands peacemaker. And it's interesting. That he's doing wild dog and wild dog is, is sort of like, he's sort of like a peacemaker like character. The way I would describe this story, it's almost like die hard meets peacemaker meets gizmo. I mean, you know, I mean, except it's not in an airport. It's not in a maca copy or whatever the, the, that, High rise building, <laughs> yeah. Nakakomi, yeah, building, and it doesn't take place over Christmas. Uh, but uh, this isn't a Christmas story. Uh, Die Hard is a Christmas movie, but this is not a Christmas story. But uh, anyways, it's it's a lot of fun, and and it's great great humor. And Wild Dog gets his moment. The crowd cheers. You know, I mean, the last time a uh, hero managed to uh, you know def you know defeat the bad guy in front of a crowd, I re I remember that scene in Superman Returns where he he catches the air playing in a baseball yeah. field and everybody cheers yeah. you know now this is wild dog taking out gizmo on a field and says wild who dares says gizmo wild dog dares it takes away <laughs> there's just some fun moments here this is really i mean man give kyle stark starks more work because this guy understands these characters and admittedly Obviously, Wild Dog and Peacemaker are similar characters with sort of similar, probably, character dispositions. Uh, but give Kyle, and I'd be really curious, give Kyle another character, maybe different, because he seems to do his homework and he seems to have a lot of fun writing his stories. And that fun comes through. And so I, I'd like to see him write uh, so, some more DC characters to see what else he has uh, up his arsenal, so to speak. And, uh, you know, maybe give him, uh, well, I, I don't know. I can't, so I'm, I won't speculate, but uh, give him any yeah, title. Speculate. I was going to ask. So, yeah, well, let's say he's well, going to write. Gonna say, uh, yeah, I was going to say. Uh, I was going to say Suicide Squad, but we, we, we always seem to get a Suicide Squad story, and I think that's that's maybe too obvious an answer. But I wouldn't mind, uh, you know, uh, give him something different, like give him maybe a yeah. Booster Gold or uh, a Booster Booster Gold or Blue Beetle or uh, or or even just I don't know, just go uh, even give him a, a team, uh, give him a Titans or give him a uh, something different, give him a Stormwatch. Or give him a, you know, a, a, or even a Wildcats. I mean, this this guy seems to have a lot of fun, and and his and there's a clarity to his storytelling that I like. It's easy to catch on to, you know. The pacing is good, the dialogue is good and crisp, and transitions are great. Now he happens to be working with both with both Peacemaker and here with Wild Dog stories. He's working with very talented artists. Give him a good artist. And, uh, you know, have a little faith in him because this guy seems to get it and he understands the assignment. And wow, this was a, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, I, yeah, feel, I feel like Suicide, Suicide Squad, Squad. Yeah, that's probably but that's like the obvious choice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah, a lot of those are kind of tangential. Give but him if you crime, syndicate, him, crime syndicate. Crime syndicate. Give him uh, that. Yeah, yeah, you could do that as well. But again, I mean, you're, you're like, I'm saying let's this let's put this guy on an A-list character. Right. Like, so yeah. if he had to write somebody from the like the justice league right? right so superman batman wonder woman green lantern flash hawkman uh martian manhunter aquaman uh whom yeah. green arrow who who yeah i think yeah of those who would you like he's going to be on a main character wow who would you, um, who would you give him jeez uh well if i had to be somebody from the justice league um i'd probably maybe go with uh I would like to see him write Guy Gardner. That would be kind of cool. Yeah, okay. I think he'd have a lot of yeah. fun with Guy Gardner because he's he's got he's got the humor down, and he just he, he seems to, you know, I think yeah that part, I'd go with Guy Gardner. Yeah. Yeah, I I want him on I want him on Hawkman. I think like my first. Oh, my that's first a good one too. That's a good choice. Yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, my first thought was oh Green Green Lantern Hal Jordan, for sure. 
But I'm like, you know what, though? Uh, yeah, I like my Hal a little more straight laced. Uh, but Hawkman, like, I mean, he's, I, I would argue that Hawkman is the most similar to Peacemaker and Wild Dog. You know, he's got that streak of violence in him. So yeah, I'd love to see Kyle Starks on a Hawkman book for sure. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> the Aquaman communion story, Gabriel Hardman, writer and artist, Matt Hollingsworth on colors, Simon uh, Bolin on letters. It's okay. It feels very paint by the numbers. Um, you know, we had some it definitely followed, the, you know, uh, arc one, arc two, arc three, right? Like very traditional storytelling here from Gabriel Hardman. First part was all set up. Second was the explanation of what's going on. Now the third one is just, okay, Aquaman goes to Gorilla City. He manages to meet with Solvar. He says, hey, Solvar, this is going on. You don't have to believe me. Look in my mind. You'll see. Okay, it's going on. I believe you. Hey, let's get all the gorillas and go to the place and save the day. And that's kind of what happened. So it, it wasn't bad by any stretch, but it also wasn't really memorable. Uh, the art from Hardman and the uh, visual storytelling is the strength of the story. But in terms of, you know, something I'm, I'm going to remember, you know, a few months from now, uh, this is, this is not it. So uh, anything to add Rocky? Not really. I mean, it's, it's not Gabriel Hardman's fault that I, uh, that I'm just, you know, most of the time I'm just, Aquaman just doesn't, it's not a story that, I, that usually it's not a character that I'm normally drawn to. Um, but, you know, Hawk, Aquaman's one of those characters that whenever he's written well, it surprises me. And usually it's a writer I got to give high compliments to. And uh, that's happened before. That's happened before uh, with, with Aquaman, like if, whether it's Peter David or uh, I didn't even mind uh, Kelly C. DeConnick's Aquaman run, to be honest. I actually enjoyed that. But, uh, you know, it's not, not an insult. It's just Aquaman is a character that there's... I don't know. It's just a character that is so hit and miss with me. And th this is not bad. This is not bad. I just, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's just, uh, it's, it's, I would uh, maybe put Kyle Starks on, on Aquaman. If he could, if he could make me uh, fa an Aquaman fan, a uh, long-term Aquaman fan, that would be a feat. Uh, but, but no one's been able to do that, including Gabriel Hardman. But that's, that, that's not an insult. That's just a challenge that no one's been able to overcome. Yeah, yeah, Aquaman definitely doesn't have a sense of humor. Never, never has. So maybe that's yeah. what he needs to make him work. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, the last story by Bruno Redondo, uh, black and white. Nor is the Batman. Um, I sort of didn't get the point of this story. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm a Bruno Redondo fan. I love the guy. The art here. It's black and white, but it's still very, very good. It's Batman early on in his career, um, but I. I, again, I sort of don't get the point. Like he's going after the Joker, and he falls and spends weeks in a uh, having to recover from injuries. Uh, you know, unconscious for two days. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. And he, he gets his grappling gun for the first time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know what else to say. Like that's all that happens. Like he he meets with Jim Gordon. He fights with Joker and they both fall off a roof. He's badly injured. Lucius Fox shows up with a grappling gun. Okay. If you think that's a Batman story, you're right. Cause here it is. Uh, the visual storytelling again, strong. The art's absolutely fantastic, but this yeah. feels incomplete. This feels <laughs> in incomplete. Where's the other half of my story? Uh, I don't know. Kind of weird. Yeah. It, it it's funny this story is you know again it's you know it's the first time batman uses a grappling gun and go, oh, guess what surprise surprise he gets really badly injured and you know it's funny that the i laughed out loud that the final words of this story is uh it's narrated but you know by you know by alfred and he says no man is an island nor is the batman and bat and bruce wayne's sitting there and his thumbs are all bandaged his fingers are bandaged up his arm is bust and his head's bandaged up and and i'm thinking to myself when he says no man is an island nor is batman no batman is an island batman has had repeated injury after injury after injury if batman was is an island He's been sunk, uh, and he keeps. He's an island that can't be sunk, and he's he is really indestructible. It's hilarious how many injuries this guy has come back from again and again and again and again and again. And again. Batman's an island. I don't care what anybody says. Uh, Batman's, so, the, Batman's the island from Lost. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't make any doesn't make any sense how he can have injury after injury and still fight. But yeah, yeah. he's Batman. 
It doesn't matter how much you prepare. If your body is destroyed, you can, you know, you, you forget about preparation, but you know, Batman, Batman always heals. I mean, I mean, that's the real impressive thing about Batman is his healing factor. He's not supposed to be Wolverine, but apparently he's got the same healing factor, but nobody acts. It's, it's no one's saying the quiet part out loud, but uh, maybe that could be like the, a new secret origin for Batman. He's actually had superpowers all along. I would believe that. <laughs> But, yeah, well, yeah. look at the way he gets his ass whooped by aliens in uh, Batman Off World. That's right. Aaron. Like, dude, no, you don't get up from that. I don't care that you have like the, you know, the the best or strongest strength of will of any human that's ever existed. When your body's broken, it doesn't respond. Like, uh, yeah. Anyway, he also jumped from the moon, so you know, enough said. Enough, enough said. Let's let's move on. So speaking of books that aren't for Rocky, uh, Harley Quinn 36 is up next. Tinny Howard on script. Sweeney Boo uh, handles the art and color. Steve Wands on letters. Uh, we saw last time that the, the brothers I are actually the big bads of the story. They've taken over um, Lady Quark and her husband. Uh, the multiversal intelligent versions of Bud and Lou, the Harley's two hyenas are helping keep them uh, at bay along with the multiversal detective uh, Lux, who's been uh, sort of a sidekick to Harley this whole time. So they're trying to figure out what's going on. They're trying to figure out what these guys want. Uh, ultimately Lux convinces Harley to after rescuing Kevin, who's lost in the multiverse convinces Harley to go back to earth and her, uh, you know, her earth, earth, earth prime. And Harley's worry is that, no, I don't. I don't want to, you know, attract these brothers' eye to Earth, um, because it's going to hurt a lot of people. You know, we need to find a way to defeat them. And Lux's argument is, but that's where the greatest heroes in all the multiverse reside is on Earth Prime, and they love you and they'll help you and what have you. So Harley agrees. They go back to Earth Prime. Lux immediately starts calling all the heroes, asking for help, and everybody's busy. You know what he's answering their phone, uh, and there is kind of a funny line at one point where. Lux says, ah, after every crisis, these heroes change their phone number uh, and then I can't get a hold of anybody, you know, and I, I took that as sort of an analog to, you know, after every crisis, they change the number of the book and everybody gets a new restart at number one kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, the, so Harley's fate uh, forced to agree to sacrifice f to save her students who've also been turned into Brother's Eye um, and to stop the Brother's Eye from attacking Earth. Uh, she, she agrees to go, go with them to the, this, all this attack, everything the brothers I have been doing has all been to capture Harley Quinn, but she, she, uh, convinces them to allow her to go see poison Ivy one last time. He's like, she, she's like, Hey, let me go see my girlfriend. And she needs to hear this from me that I'm going to, you know, give up and go with you. And the brother's eyes like, we've always wanted a girlfriend. So we understand. And they let her go. Um, and then we get the big reveal uh, at the end when she comes back and she's a little late, you know, she's supposed to go right there and then come right back. Um, but poison Ivy wants to make out a little bit. And in Harley's own word, she says, Hey, when you, when you have a hot girlfriend, she wants to make out, you make out. Um, so sorry, you know, I'm late getting back, but come to find out that the reason the brothers, I want Harley is because they've seen her become something more than the sum of her parts. They've seen her become more, uh, than you know what people expected her to become uh, after all the trauma and the relationship with the joker or what, or what have you and the brother's eyes uh they see themselves in that same light right like they see themselves as um as victimized as traumatized and, and what have you so they think that harley's biggest superpower maybe her only superpower is the ability to overcome trauma and have belief in herself and what have you and so they want to uh take her and sort of incorporate that aspect of her into, I guess, their programming. It's They don't come right out and say it, but they say they're going to use Harley to kind of better themselves. So pretty interesting and not at all where I thought the story was going. You could make the argument that Tinny Howard has taken a long time to get there. Um, and even in this issue, uh, you know, there's other parts that kind of meander around. They go to rescue Kevin. They do this or do that. I sort of feel like some of it's not needed, but if you're a fan of the zany Harley and you, you like this story, it's just more of it to like, right? If you like this tone and you like the way Harley's been going and it's been selling rel relatively well, not as certainly not at the heights it once was, but it's also not, um, 
at the lows it was either. Uh, the, as much as I liked the Stephanie Phillips run, it, it didn't sell real well. Neither did uh, the um, Sam Humphreys run that came came before that. This is selling better than those two runs. Um, but I don't know. Maybe that's the Sweeney Boo art. I, I, I can't yeah. really speak to it um, because for me, I'm not a fan of the Zany Harley. I like the Stephanie Phillips stuff more. I like the Sam Humphrey stuff more, but this, you know, it is what it is. At least we've got sort of an explanation now. Like I said, it took a while to get there. Um, turns out to not really be that interesting to me. I don't really like the whole, Oh, Harley was a victim and she, you know, pulled herself up from her bootstraps. Whatever. I, I, I just don't, I just don't care about Harley Quinn enough to really care about any of that. And I get that a lot of that was what Jimmy and Amanda did and taking her out of Gotham and getting her away from the Joker and whatever. And I recognize that, that you know, for her, for the character it was a healthy thing to do. Her relationship with Joker was very toxic. She, in a lot of ways, she was a toxic character. If you're looking at her as sort of quote unquote, a role model to, you know, put up with all the abuse and what have you, but the Joker's a bad guy. So what do you expect? But I get that you still don't want to showcase that for a character that's really popular. And, and again, that's why Harley's gone from being a villain to anti-hero now to straight up hero. Um, yeah. But again, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't interest me. I don't care. I don't care about Harley as a villain. I don't care about Harley as an anti-hero. I don't care about Harley as a hero. <laughs> I don't care that the brothers I want to, you know, somehow be more like Harley. Like to me, that's not something you would aspire to. Um, give me the Harley that's intelligent and confident and sort of a badass. Like, to some extent, the Sean Gordon Murphy verse Harley, a hundred percent to the extent of Joker Harley criminal sanity from, um, oh my God, I'm drawing, I just drew a blank on her name. Miko Suyan and Jason Badower on art. Cami Garcia was the writer. That's the Harley I want. Like right. just a badass criminal profiler going after. You want to make Harley a hero? Give me that. But yeah. that's probably too far away from zany Harley origins because she doesn't crack jokes and she's not giggling and being saying nonsensical stuff. Um, but the, you know, that stuff doesn't interest me, but again, I, I'm not the target audience for this either. Rocky. I mean, honestly, it's probably, you know, 12, 13, 14 year old girls that are reading this, that are buying it, that are keeping the yes. sales propped up and they're probably digging it. Uh, yeah. and yeah, it's, it's, you know, when you talk about learning that lesson and being, you know, getting over your trauma, whatever that, that is a good lesson for young people to learn. You and I, we've either learned that lesson by this point, or we're ne we're so old we're never going to learn that lesson. We cause trauma. We cause trauma for other people yeah, to overcome. Yeah, That's exactly. what <laughs> we cause trauma to whoever is listening to the podcast. So, uh, so anyway, at, at least there's four. I'll say this: uh, the art is gorgeous, and there's um, there's forward momentum in the story. You can see the light at the end of the tunnel now. Um, so you know, if you want to, like the least common denominator for positives for this you can you can look to that there are moments here that are funny that are enjoyable and the art's fantastic both in line work and color so yeah. uh yeah i don't even know did you even read this i i i did actually yeah uh, yeah it, it and you know i actually echo your sentiment that you know look uh it, it's if it's selling reasonably well i mean obviously it's I'm, I'm pleased to hear it has an audience that audience isn't me it's not my cup of tea uh, but I got to tell you, it would have more of an audience of guy, for guys like me if the backup that we'll be talking about was, if I got that for six, if I got Harley the Barbarian for six issues, boy, would I be on board with that. Stephen Beach and Bar fantastic. But this main story, Sweeney Boo's art is fantastic. It's it's. It's very uh, stylistic, but Sweeney Boo is a great artist. Um, the story here, uh, my, 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 my central criticism about Harley Quinn under uh, it, as her comic book for DC Universe, I'll just reiterate it, is that it deviates repeatedly and in an ongoing way from the continuity of the DC Universe. It's, it's one thing to, to have this story, please tell me, it has to be outside of continuity, but I'm sure DC would insist that as part of continuity. It can't be. Why? Because, brother, because there's no way the brother eye is that stupid. It, they're machines. They're not going to care about how some random mentally ill person who's, who formerly dated the Joker recovers from her personal drama. I mean, come on. I mean, but again, I guess that's part of the story, and there's, there's readership there that will relate to that because we all know 14 year olds date psychotic boyfriends because men are bad but uh that's just me you know i'm just saying like it's just sort of like i just throw my hands up in the air when if, if i try to 
you know, but you're right. You know, six. This is like this has got to be the sixth or seventh issue of this storyline, and I, I sure to God hope that there's parts that are funny, and there are. But I mean, the law of averages would suggest there ought to be a couple moments, and there are uh, not as much as I would like. But the art's good. Sweeney Boo's art's really good, uh, and uh, I guess she hasn't been on every issue. But in any event, it's 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 it it, it will wrap up. I hope when. Will it wrap up before September this year? I don't know, but I don't, um, you know, Harley Quinn, multiversal hero, uh, that ain't for me, but man, uh, do you want to start talking about the backup? Because uh, man, do I love that backup. Yeah, I would say, I, I don't know exactly what they've collected so far for Tinny Howard's run, but I would say, you know, I get that you're going to divide stuff up for trade and what have you, it's five or six issues. She's only told one story this whole time. I know it's only, been, it, yeah, it's only been one. Yeah, it's only been one. This multiversal story, and it started off maybe didn't realize it was the multiversal story, but right from the first issue where she pulls that vorpal fish out yeah. of the um, zoo crew world, basically, uh, it's all been the same story. Yeah, as far as the backup goes, I mean, um, <clears throat> I didn't enjoy it as much as you, obviously. Well, let me give the the. Uh, the credits first. It's written by Alexis Guasarano, Q U A S A R A N O. I probably butchered that, so my apologies. The art is amazing by Steve Beach, who uh, he's been doing um, some variant covers for Superman and Action Comics recently, and they're just fantastic. Letters by Hassan Otsman Elhow. Uh, it, it's fantastic. Like when you talk about a barbarian Harley, you know, like a cross <laughs> between Harley and Conan the Barbarian, and and you know, you can think back to what um those uh those pictures on on the the robert e howard novels like the fantasy covers you know uh, or or you know really any type of um sword and sorcery cover from those dime store novels back in the day where you know scantily clad women and guy with giant muscles and blood's dripping everywhere and he's got his sword and he's just chopped the head off of some monster and there's icker dripping off the sword and what have you like that that's the style of art that we're talking about here and steve beach is the perfect artist to do this so for me the where this this story shines is in the art uh in terms of the actual story i'll give credit to alexis uh i won't try to mispronounce the last name again um the the vocabulary that's chosen is very hammy and over the top but it also kind of suits that style of story they're trying to tell right like you expect it to be hammy and over the top and so for that reason it it does work but i, I just i have such a hard time like with what i know of harley uh thinking of her as a barbarian like i think she'd get killed in her first fight uh but then who am i to say because you know we're talking about harley quinn and she took on the trinity in one so uh so anyway, I, I thought it was okay. I loved it for the art. The story itself was just kind of okay. So what do you, what do you think? I mean, I know you loved it. So Well, yeah, no. Uh, but, you, you know, like, there's no rhyme or reason in the main story with Harley. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's all over the place. At least yeah, this, sure. it, at least there's no, there's there's just no pretentiousness here. I mean, if you're going to go full, if you're going to, if you're going to make Harley, you know, full Harley crazy, to me, quite frankly, uh, Harley Quinn being a little bit off her rocker, you know, prone to make bad relationships, inevitably and always entering toxic relationships, being screwed up. She is hell. She's perfect for a Conan the Barbarian like character. Uh, give her a hammer, give her a make her a barbarian where she goes around beating people up. It doesn't have to make sense. You're a barbarian and you stumble upon. And that's that's the central conceit of Harley, despite the fact that she's not particularly bright, but yet actually is really intelligent. But she is socially sort of inept and, and doesn't socially sort of awkward but yet she does have an intelligence uh she manages to fluke off winning at the end of the day almost like a Gru, the wanderer type character and so combine Gru and combine harley you got harley the barbarian and that's why i think this actually kind of works in a crazy kind of way and and it ends and i even like the way i mean the way it the, the way that the writer teases the ending there with you know harley harley the barbarian getting together with the goddess poison ivy but it doesn't show it and then another harley version breaking the fourth wall saying hey that was you know show us the sex scene i mean i i sort of like it, it it's it's it uh it's fun it's 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 fun it's action-packed and you even got like the huntress like character and i i don't even know if the male character is that's a constantine 
character. I'm not sure who that character is supposed to be. But <laughs> uh, anyways, I, I, I had a lot of fun with it. And I know I, I, know I normally kind of complain about a billion different iterations of Harley, but every now and then one comes around that I find interesting, and I would like to have this being a particular Earth. Give, give make Harley the barbarian. Give her a, you know, in the multiverse or the, in the in hyper time, give her her own planet and give me a mini series with Harley the barbarian. I think that would be fantastic. And then have a bunch of crazy barbarian like characters of uh, making fun and, and parodies of all the other uh, DC characters. That would be fun, and have it take place in continuity, but in a different universe multiverse and you can still have fun with it uh i find that a lot more interesting than perverting the idea of brother i and and i don't even know what whatever uh, exactly what's going on anthropomorphizing the two dogs and i don't know give me harley the barbarian man and of course i'm biased because i love conan the barbarian i got a huge conan barbarian collection not to mention red sonia you gotta love those dynamite covers and uh you know in any event you, you know what Variant cover I'm going to be buying of this particular issue, pure cover buy. Uh, it's going to be uh, Steve Beecham, if if I can, assuming it's not a, there's a, one of the covers has a, a part of the Barbarian on it. Assuming it's not a ratio variant, it probably is. I'll, I'll pick it up. Uh, yeah, do you, don't you wish that this version of Harley, this was the version of Harley we could have got in, uh, in Dark Knights of Steel, Dark Ages? Yeah, she's kind of useless. She's kind of useless in that story. She really doesn't do yeah, much. Yeah, she's a jester. Yeah, or the yeah, or, she's a jester, and she she kind of kind of carries yeah. messages back and forth. Uh, yeah, at various times. That's right. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the Steve Beach cover is the one in fifty. Um, yeah most expensive but, covers so. yeah naturally so i won't be getting it but i mean that's just dc for you they take a great yeah. idea like this they put it as a backup and then they make the cover inaccessible to 90 percent of the readership and make it into one in 50 just another blundering stupid idea uh it, it, per editorial planning like we need six issues of that teeny howard story we could have got maybe two or three issues with this uh harley the barbarian come on i mean purian fanboys out there like me demand attention <laughs> yeah, you can always just you know save the digital version of the cover, buy the, and then you yeah put it on a for your wallpaper or something. Uh, all right, up next we have Power Girl issue number five, written by Leah Williams, uh, art is by David Baldione, colors by Romulo Fajardo Jr., letters by Becca Carey. This is a really fun issue. It's it's a nearly silent issue. The Gary Frank cover is fantastic, and it it, it, it very much hints at uh, what's to come in the issue. Um, it's got Streaky there taking a little nap and Power Girl's looking at Streaky thinking, oh, look at how peaceful Streaky is sleeping. She's probably dreaming of, you know, running through uh, this little <laughs> garden and chasing a butterfly or whatever. And then we see what Streaky's actually dreaming about and she's out in space and she's attacking uh, uh, like some kind of a space fighter vehicle that's uh, attacking her and it's being flown by a dog she's a cat obviously cats dogs what have you um so it's just it's fun so it's a nearly silent issue with uh streaky rescuing a bunch of animals that are being experimented on um that are being stolen uh some are some are pets some are strays what have you um but she's able to to let herself she kind of plays possum she lets herself get captured gets taken to this uh, warehouse where some looks to be some sort of mad scientist is experimenting on all these different animals. She frees the animals. Um, it doesn't necessarily show that the bad guys get captured, but she frees the animals and a lot of them are taken back to their, um, their respective owners. And then she goes and climbs in bed with Power Girl, who then wakes up, scratch it, and you know, Screechy's been out on this, uh, Streaky rather has been out uh, on this adventure all night. Power Girl's like, oh, did you sleep well, blah, 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 and walks out to the living room, and Kara is there, Supergirl's there, and we're going to get a team up, so we're told what's coming next. We're going to get a team up between uh, Power Girl and Supergirl going forward, I guess. Supergirl does mention, as she's there to recruit Power Girl, hey, uh, what we're going to do might be illegal, so I guess that's supposed to be intriguing. Um, I, I do find it interesting that DC's chosen to do this and Leia Williams has chosen to do this because, you know, I've talked about it before how there really is not much of a difference between Supergirl and Power Girl. Um, and that's sort of the struggle 
and the challenge with the two characters. So teaming them up, I guess we're going to see some contrast. And, and you know, the, I feel like the whole reason this Power Girl series exists currently is they are trying to differentiate. That's why they changed uh, Power Girl's name from Karen Starr to Paige. I don't even know if we've gotten a last name. They're giving her this job at Star Labs. Like they're doing a lot of stuff to try to make her different, um, differentiate her from, from Kara, from Supergirl. But I don't know, man. At the end of the day, it's a blonde person that has the same basic powers as Superman. People are constantly going to get them confused. That's just the way that it goes. But but this was a fun issue. Really uh, fantastic art from David Baldione. And that Gary Frank covers uh, awesome. So what are your thoughts on it, Rocky? Uh, I want to give a compliment to artist David Baldion. I, I thought for Streaky, I mean, this is a, an issue about Streaky the cat, who is actually Supergirl's cat, but Power Girl ended up acquiring it and Supergirl never objected to it. Uh, there's actually a cool scene where Streaky goes up and is looking for the lost pets and she uses, the, the cat is using her super senses just like Superman would if he hovered over the city and can hear everything. There's this cat and this cat can, with his super senses, can locate it and then swooshes down to the rescue. I mean, this is really anthropomorphizing this, uh, this cat in, in, uh, without actually uh, converting it to a human, that, uh, to a superhuman. That I, I thought it worked very well. And it's a mostly silent issue, and I think it worked. Uh, I think it worked pretty good. Uh, it's. Um, I think it's a little bit by the numbers, a little bit close to the nose. It's not not particularly complicated. Um, I would have. Uh, it it would have been. I don't know who this who this villain is, but I wonder if Streaky now has her own. Streaky has her own arch nemesis with this redheaded, spectacled female villain. Uh, <laughs> who is an evil kidnapper of dogs and cats and animals. So I think that's interesting. This this villain, if it is Streaky's new arch nemesis, doesn't have a name because it's an all silent issue for the most part when, until we get really get to the end when Power Girl wakes up and, you know, tells Streaky that, oh, you probably don't do much in your, during your, your day. And, uh, but... Yeah, so but it, it was an okay issue. It was definitely a filler issue, but it, it was nice to have maybe uh, have some give some nice to have a break, I, I suppose. Uh, although scratch that, I would rather not have a break. I don't think Power Girl should have a cat. I don't like cats. I, I'm not a cat lover, uh, straight up at all. I, I I find them annoying, and I find that they take up space. And uh, if I think an accurate representation of a cat with superpowers would truly be uh, a super villain by every stretch of the imagination, but I digress. Um, I have mixed feelings about Power Girl and Supergirl sort of teaming up. I think the whole point of a Power Girl comic is to show how Power Girl is different and to dis differentiate her from Supergirl. Having Super, putting her on an adventure with Supergirl, uh, I guess that's one way of doing it. And then during the adventure, you could, you know, Lee Williams could show how Supergirl and Power Girl are different, I suppose. Uh, that's that's one way of doing it, but you know, because it is odd that Supergirl doesn't have her own comic, but Power Girl does. Uh, but I, I would, um, I keep thinking of Jimmy Palmiotti's and Amanda Connor's Power Girl run, which, you know, uh, to me it's beloved. Like I just absolutely love it, and it was so much fun and pay, you know, and and Karen as she was now in her Power Girl, she just she had her own villains, she had her own personality, and had a very u unique particular style. And I don't know why, you know, I would, I would hope Lee Williams would be a little bit more, uh, take a little bit more risk and try to distinguish Power Girl more, moving her away from Supergirl. But hey, you know what? Maybe she's being told by editorial, you know, team up with Supergirl because maybe that, maybe that leads to more sales. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I've got mixed feelings about it. But I, I liked, I've, I've liked Lee Williams so far and I've, I've liked the symbiote ship. I like that storyline leading up to, to this. This is definitely, though, is kind of like a, this is taking a break type of issue. And for cat lovers, you got to pick this up for sure. Yeah, 100%, 100%. an issue for cat lovers. Uh, all right, up next we have Green Arrow number eight from writer Joshua Williamson. Pencils are by Phil Hester. Inks by Eric Gapster. Colors by Mulo Fajardo Jr. Letters by Troy Petrie. So at the end of last issue, we saw Onomatopoeia on the roof looking down at Connor Hawk and Oliver Queen as they were having a conversation. And then this one kicks off with uh, – this issue kicks off with Oliver Queen dead in the morgue. Uh, and then we flash back and um, 
Connor's there and like, oh my God, you know, we couldn't stop him, what have you. Um, and yeah, supposedly Onomatopoeia killed Oliver Queen. Connor's out for justice. We find out that uh, after Connor follows Onomatopoeia to um, a yacht out in the harbor where Brick is. So Brick hired uh, Onomatopoeia to kill Oliver Queen. And the reason that Brick did it was because of Amanda Waller's claim that uh, if you can kill a superhero, you can get immunity and you can get all this money and get paid and get rich and what have you. So that's what Brick Brick took it upon himself to hire somebody because uh, in his words, Onomatopoeia can kill a bunch of people uh, and he didn't want to get his hands dirty. Um, but what we learn is that it was all faked. Oliver Queen is not really dead. And in fact, the Onomatopoeia that goes to meet Brick is actually Oliver Queen in disguise. Um and uh, they take down Brick and they're uh, pumping, in for, pumping him for information saying, you know, they find out about the Amanda Waller thing and, and um, what's going on there. And then uh, they say, OK, well, what about Roy? The last time anybody saw um, Arsenal, he was uh, captured by Amanda Waller. He was looking for Amanda Waller. Uh, you know, she must have captured him. What have you? And Brick's like, what are you talking about? She's uh, he's working for Amanda Waller. That's, that's what he's doing. Uh, and so obviously that's a big surprise to Oliver Queen and, uh, and Connor Hawk. And we'll see uh, what, what happens from there. Um, I mean, if anything, it's probably like um, <coughs> what Red Hood was doing. I hate to bring it up, but uh, future state Gotham. Um, <laughs> when uh, Red Hood was, you know, working for the, whatever it was, I can't even remember what it was called. Now. Magistrate. A magistrate. There you go. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I guess we'll have to wait and see how that plays out. So what are your thoughts on this issue? Uh, it's an okay issue. I want to give a shout out to Phil Hester. The last time we saw his uh, his art was on uh, Gotham City Year One, or at least that's the last time I remember his art. And I, I Gotham City Year One was my favorite DC comic overall of 2023. So shout out to him. I thought his uh, he complimented Tom King's story very well. And Phil Hester, of course, is uh, well known. He's certainly one of his claims to fame is that he had a longstanding uh, run on Green Arrow himself. So it's it's good to see him back on Green Arrow for for this story. Uh, I don't know how long he'll be on this title. Maybe it's just for an issue or more. I'm not sure. But uh, I, story-wise, it's it's not bad. It's it's Williamson is you know he wasn't sure. This has been I believe now it's going to go to 12 issues. This is set to end in June. Uh, the 12th issue, which is supposed to be I think the final issue, is going to end in June. And if that's the case, that that puts that starts us off in the summer month, July, August, and then we're going to have this rumored DC event in September. And so I think the timing is right. I do think that we're just buying time. This is being dragged out. I think the writing's on the wall. While Green Arrow might be really surprised that uh, Arsenal is uh, working with Amanda Waller, I'm not surprised at all. It's predictable. It's cliche. It's derivative. There's a whole slew of people that are hanging. Let me guess. He's working for Amanda Waller because he wants to find out what she's really up to so he can destroy her from within, right? Okay. What? No. Um, he's yeah. really a bad guy now. Yeah, he's yeah really exactly. I mean, her. it's just, it, you know, I, 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 you know, I'm, I guess maybe I'm sounding a little bit like a, like a negative Nelly here, but it, this is just, this is, it just feels like this is all sort of like dragged out. And this is stuff that we already know. I, I'd like to have a different twist on this, like, or just something something different but Oliver if he's just going to be jumping and then he's going to have more angst with his family and more more superfluous fill-ins and everything else I'm just I don't know like and I, I'm disappointed in this issue I would have liked to have seen I, I want to see more of Leon I want to see more of uh, Cheshire I want to see more of the characters I'm actually interested in but just goes to show you I guess they're really not part of the Green Arrow family are they uh, but or if they are I guess just Williamson doesn't doesn't find them all that interesting or if he does he's just focusing on Oliver Queen here and that's fair I'm just I just I just feel that this is I feel that this is so predictable so derivative I, I don't think we're going to learn anything new over the next four issues at all about Amanda Waller about what she's up we already know what she's up to let's just get to it already this is the, the longest plotting scenario that we're getting and we're just and uh, it's just it's just frustrating so uh, but you know so this this was a meh issue for me, but if you're a Green Arrow fan, by all means, and again, Phil Hester, 
I mean, I'll, I'm picking this up because of Phil Hester and as a, uh, because I, I, I still, I, I, I feel like I owe it to him just for giving us his art on uh, Gotham City Year One. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, Automatopoeia is such a great character too. So yeah, yeah that's kind of what, where I got my enjoyment. Because you're right, uh, very much a meh issue, very predictable. It goes back to what I was saying at the beginning uh, when I talked about the overall week and how it's just sort of, eh just kind of average and then yeah, i've been saying it throughout right like i talked about it with uh with raven where it's the same story over and over here yeah. we go with amanda waller same story over and over here we go with green arrow say it's yeah. just yeah everything is just so like you said derivative and plotting and retread and yeah these characters have been around for decades it's getting a little more challenging um so uh, i don't know i don't know what the answer is um more dynamic editor more dynamic yeah. editor in chief, better publishing decisions. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, all right. Last book we're going to talk about in detail uh, Amazon's Attack Part Four. Josie Campbell is the writer, Vasco Gregev on art, Alex Squirmus on colors, Becca Carey on letters. Uh, I'm going to let you go first, Rocky. Um, do we have a rant incoming? Uh, I don't know. Uh, let me see here. I just want to put. Uh, uh, Sorry, I'm just, where's my, oh, there it is. Yeah, uh, well, there's really not much to rant about here. I, I just, I find this issue, this, this, it's part four of the Burning City. It's Amazon's Attack is, is a sort of a collateral series or a side issue series that sort of, as a, you can read it as a supplement to uh, Tom King's Wonder Woman, although I don't think it's necessary, but but it does perhaps explain the the the, the, the larger world at at stake, and that is uh, as essentially the uh, all the one the rest of the Wonder Team, you know the the you know uh, uh, Nubia and uh, Mary Marvel and um, uh, Wonder Girls are. Yeah, and uh, yeah, Yara Floor, Yara Floor sorry, and Queen Faruka. Yeah, they're they're battling against Eris, or they this the the god of chaos has been killed, and these these apples of discord have been used by a force by 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 the enemy that uh, that we're not really clear who the enemy is yet, uh, and these apples of discord have been used around the world to to actually get the entire world against the Amazons, not just the U.S. Because there's there's pockets uh, there there because they're prior to uh, in the events following the the the, um, the alleged or the Amazonian terrorist attack uh, on that bar in, in Wonder Woman issue one uh, the the result was that various pockets of the world particularly Greece allowed Amazons to seek sanctuary in the protected uh, by the country of Greece. And there were other pockets of resistance and pockets of protection at various places around the world. And um, unfortunately, because these apples of discords have been used uh, to see discord, uh, Amazons have fewer and fewer places to hide out in safety other than if they're on Themyscira proper. And um, this issue really just from last year, not a heck of a lot happens. It's, uh, there, there seems to be... I, some of it seems a little bit silly. There's actually pamphlets that are handed out at various parts of the U.S. Are you harboring Amazons in your home? It seems very McCarthyism, like really embracing inner McCarthy. Uh, this idea that you know they're really doubling down. America's really being psychologically manipulated. I'm assuming through these apples of discord to to really hate Amazons and to ostracize them and and um, meanwhile Queen Nubia knows something's up. Uh, at Yara, Yara Floor is, uh, and, and Wonder Girl end up being attacked by by the by the U.S. military, and then, and and all of this is a giant fight scene, and they're attacked because they're Amazon. There's no movement of the plot. And last issue we had Mary Marvel uh, in prison talking to uh, Georgina Savannah, and uh, she is, you know, she was trying to escape prison and for some reason it takes her so long to just walk out of the prison and say, say Shazam. This feels really dragged on in this issue. Not much happens and um, and it ends with Queen Faruka being essentially confronted by uh, a peacemaker. So uh, again we're getting 
we're getting sort of a, a sort of a piecemeal movement of the plot. You can kind of tell. I'm guessing this is six issues long. This series, at some point, uh, they're going to wrap up and destroy all the apples of uh, apples of discord. Of discord. In the meantime, I, I'm not sure how that's going to coincide with Tom King's Wonder Woman, uh, because right now, it's. And this is a criticism, and maybe a mini rant, but I really feel that there's not a great deal of synchronicity between on, between Tom King's Wonder Woman and this. There is on the surface that we got the apples of Discord uh, at play that's working in conjunction with the Sovereign over in Wonder Woman. But I just feel it's just to not have the Sovereign here. To not have the Sovereign make an appearance, to not have any of the villains that we got in issue 5 of Wonder Woman, of, of Grail, or Angle Man, or Dr. Psycho, to not have them make an appearance here, but have a completely different set of villains in Amazon's attack, that doesn't feel like a crossover. It's a huge missed opportunity. It feels like a huge disconnect. But you can't have that, and I hate to say it, as much as I love Tom King, and people... People who watch this and listen to us know that we're generally, we love a lot, of, most of what Tom King does. He just doesn't play well with others. He just doesn't. And, and, and so I, I can understand that. But I feel that what a missed opportunity that we're getting really Georgina Savannah as one of the villains. And I don't even know who the other one is here. This, uh, I forget his name already because he's that, he's, he's that uneventful. Uh, uh, oh, oh, Count Vertigo. I mean, come on. I mean, why not have actually Amazonian villains, Cersei or, 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 or Grail or, or, you know, spice things up a bit. This is just, uh, you know, I, I don't think that in fairness to Josie Campbell, the writer, I don't think she's, she probably wasn't allowed to play with all the action figures in the sandbox because that's Tom King's domain. And that's unfortunate, but it just tells me that there wasn't enough uh, a collaboration or coordination of the storylines because I would have liked to have seen more overlap there because that we, we both know that, I mean, here's what's really, really disturbing to me. Tom King's story is very, very slow. He's at issue five and we just got introduced to the villains who's at play. And this is gonna end in six, in two issues, this Amazon's attack, I think. And so that's going to put us to issue seven with Wonder Woman. And I, there's no way that that story is going to progress that far to resolve this storyline, I don't think. So I'm trying to, in my head, try, how are you going to reconcile these two stories? I think the short answer is, is that you probably won't be able to, or I'll have to do some fanciful headcanon. But I'm, I know that I'm overthinking it, but that's what I do when I read Wonder Woman, so sue me. And, uh, but I'm just... You know, again, Josie Campbell's a good writer. In fact, she's probably, out of all the Trial of the Amazon stories, which we frankly, most most part, didn't like, Josie Campbell was the one that at least put more lipstick on the pig of that series, of that storyline, than any other writer did, hands down. And I think that's why Josie Campbell is getting these stories to write, and and deservedly so. But I I have a secret suspicion here that, uh, you know, sh she can only... She can only do so much with uh, these uh, characters because, uh, frankly, they don't really have a lot to do. The two Wonder Girls here fight the U.S. military and they have a glorified conversation. Nothing really happens. I mean, there's, I want more substance. I, I, I was expecting so much more here than this. And there's no other villains that really show up that are worthy of that, that are worthy of their caliber in my mind. This should feel like an epic event. We should get class a-list villains going against them instead of Count Vertigo and Georgina Savannah. I mean, this is just, it, this feels like they're hitting below their pay grade. And it's, it's just frustrating to me. But, you know, it is what it is. So it's a mini rant there. Uh, I hope it improves over the next two issues because right now I'm not finding this particularly exciting. But maybe you feel different. No, I don't. I don't really feel different. It, yeah, I mean, you, you kind of mentioned it as, thinking of it as sort of a companion series to um to what we're getting in um in, in tom king's run but the thing is it's so it, that is in a lot of ways kind of subtle and it, it's working on a lot of different levels and and working pretty well i think um and this is much more kind of paint by the number sort of in your face and so the the tone and the, the structure and the pacing of these two different stories are so wildly different um, that you can't help but f feel like, you know, am I am I reading two stories that are are in kind of in the same universe? You know what I mean? 
Yeah. They're so different. Now, that being said, where uh, and what I do love is the art, the Vasco Greg, Greg of art is really, really great. Uh, I really like what we're seeing um, with Greg of art. But again, I just, this is just sort of okay. You know, it's just sort of average. And yeah, I agree with you in, in terms of a companion piece to what Tom King's doing. Yeah, I mean, you're probably right. Tom doesn't always uh, do his best work when, when teaming up with others. And so I'm sure there's probably not a lot of, you know, crossover when it comes to it in terms of what these, what these writers are doing. So yeah, it just ends up being okay. Uh, unfortunately. So uh, anyway, that's going to do it for the books that we're going to talk about in detail this week in terms of collections that are out from DC. We have uh, a few of them that are out this week. So whoops, let me, sorry. I'm trying to get this stupid thing out of the way. Uh, okay, so in terms of why is it showing me collections from everybody? I only want to see DC. Uh, okay, in terms of collections this week, we've got uh, Flash, the One Minute War trade paperback. So that's the the Jeremy Adams event from um, a couple of years ago. We also have Detective Comics uh, Volume Three, Arkham Rising. Uh, also from uh, a few years ago, that's um, collects issues, uh, or sorry, it collects the backup, actually, uh, that was written by Stephanie Phillip with art by David Lapham. Um, <clears throat> we also have Mariko Tamaki, Matthew Rosenberg. Um, so if uh, you are reading Detective in Trade, you're going to want to look out for that. And then finally, we've got the DC Power uh, Celebration hardcover which collects the DC Power uh, anthology from last year, which uh, celebrates Black History Month. And obviously with February coming up, February 2024, we're gonna have a new DC Power book that's coming out um, this coming month as well. So uh, that does it for collections. Uh, Moment of Truth, Rocky, got a pick for book of the week? Uh, yeah, I will, let me see here, here. Yeah. yeah. I am going to go with the, the one that, um, yeah, I'm going to go with Detective Comics uh, for my pick of the week because uh, because it uh, I thought that that challenge I, I really like what the, the the Doctor Hurt I'm I'm fascinated by Doctor Hurt and it's funny I was never fascinated by Doctor Hurt when Grant Morrison wrote him because quite frankly I just plain forgot about him I didn't, never found him a particularly interesting character under Grant Morrison for some reason I am under Ram V and maybe it's just the maybe it's just because the inclusion of Doctor Hurt is just it's interesting and I I really like that backup by Dan Waters and I really like what you know I'm intrigued by Batman having the hallucinatory sort of conversation with Doctor Hurt in the desert where Talia took him and even with uh, the investigation of the question I think it works quite well and just the just the combination of all three of those stories combined in one book and again I, I should also mention the even the cover dress uh, I uh, it. You know, I, I should say that if you actually, when I look at all my detective comics and the cover A cover dress of detective comics, it's actually they're actually gorgeous covers. If you just look at them one at at a time, it's it's just artistically brilliant. And I love the artistic consistency on the cover dress and, and trade dress of detective comics uh, with cover A's with Ram V and and how just how how the story has taken shape. And again, I like how Ram V started off maybe annoying me by being a little bit pretentious, but the story has captured my <laughs> has captured my interest and it's something where I feel like I'm being challenged when I read it I, in a good way as opposed to having my uh, intelligence insulted like I have in s some other DC comics. So uh, what about yourself? Uh, so interesting. I'm like, should I, can I pick, um, do I pick Batman Brave and the Bold uh, just based on the wild dog story? Like, is that what I should, like I'm thinking maybe I should try that. Um, but you know, and the Joker Batman story is interesting as well. And like you said, um, I don't know how purposeful it was, but you know, you can't think of that story as tying in a, a little bit with uh, with the Joker Year One story that's coming from Zdarsky. Um, or do or do I go with Penguin because it, it really kind of changed my perspective on who the uh, Penguin is as a character in terms of him just being this. Um, really bad guy you know this really 
evil guy. Um, so I, I think ultimately, <clears throat> ultimately, I'm going to go with Batman, uh, Brave and the Bold. Um, again, I think there's a lot of value to that Joker Batman story. Um, brilliantly done, brilliant artwork from Mitch Garretts. Um, and, e- and even though the, um, the Bruno Redondo had great art, story felt a little incomplete, and the Aquaman story was just sort of okay. That Wild Dog story was just so entertaining and so fun. It was, and I just, it. it was one of those stories that while I'm reading it, I'm like, oh my god, this is so good. Oh my god, this art is great. The emotional beats are great. The the uh, facial expressions are great. The coloring is great. Like it's just, I just. It, one of those stories that while I'm reading it, I'm appreciating how much I'm enjoying it. So even though it was, you know, only one quarter of the issue, it, that's that that's how good it was for me. It, it carries the day. And I'm going to pick uh, Batman Brave and the Bold. So uh, that does it for this episode, everybody. Um, be sure you subscribe to Rocky's channel. Like he mentioned, he's got his um, Best of DC for 2023 up there. Uh, he's got other tons of other content. Uh, so you want to be sure to go and check it out, subscribe, ring the notification bell, leave comments. We love to have conversations with uh, viewers and listeners in the comment section on YouTube. So uh, be sure and check that out. If you're not sure where to go, just head over to YouTube, comic space, boom, exclamation point, uh, and you'll find our all of our DC spotlights there. Uh, conversely, if you check us out on DC every week and you want to be sure not to miss on the out on the other audio only content from the comic source, uh, just go to wherever you get your podcast and do a search for the comic source. We've got the Spawn complete chronology. We're doing a complete read of Spawn uh, in order, not publishing order, but in order of the story. So uh, just recently, this last weekend, well, we got up to issue 20 of Spawn. Then we switched over to Spawn Batman. Then we switched over to a couple of issues of Curse of Spawn. Now we're back to the regular uh, series. So it's going to go along like that. Uh, you can head over to the Comic Source YouTube channel and uh and see the pages and see the gorgeous art as we talk about it or if you want to follow along just for audio only again go to wherever you get your podcast to search for the comic source uh and we recently had todd mcfarlane himself on uh for a spawn daily episode we didn't miss our regular issue that day but we had todd on in addition to and he was gracious with his time talked to us for a little over an hour um about everything that's coming up 2024 for spawn should have the movie announcement coming soon We've got another Kickstarter, uh, this time for what uh, Todd calls his most detailed action figure ever, which is saying something when you think about as many detailed action figures as McFarland Toys has put out over the years. Uh, yeah. But it's going to be a medieval spawn action figure. And he even had some of the prototypes there. They weren't painted, but he went over and he grabbed them. He couldn't show us everything. He's like, I don't want to spoil it. But he held up some of the pieces, some of the weapons, showed us how they're going to attach. You know, a lot of times you get like extra weapons or what have you for um, – for toys and they snap on and snap off. Todd doesn't want to do that because it can break what have you. So these have little magnets where things stick on by magnets. And he also yes. has the weapons where you can take the bottom of the, like the hilt of a sword, you can take the bottom of it off the little knob and then you slip it into the hand and then you put the knob back on so it doesn't fall off. But you don't want to actually put that, push that knob all the way through the hand because then it stretches the hand out. Like he had all this cool stuff, like only something Todd and Parler would think. I was like, only you would think of that. He's like, well, when I'm messing around with my action figures and then the hand, the hand, the fingers get all loose and it doesn't hold the weapon. And I'm like, this guy's like 60 years old. He still plays around with his action figures. That's, That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, and yeah, there's a bunch more series coming in the spawn universe. Um, Sam and Twitch and a bunch of stuff coming. So go listen to the, uh, the McFarland episode. Uh, it's, it was a lot of fun and, you know, it's always great to talk to, uh, talk to Todd. So, uh, like I said, that's going to do it for this episode, everybody. We appreciate you joining as always. Uh, anything to add Rocky, you got anything coming up that you want to uh, tease? Uh, no, i I don't have anything to uh, coming up this week that I'm aware of. And to the extent that I do, I'm keeping it, uh, I, I, I don't want to confirm it because I, I might change my mind, but I, I do want to say, I, I love that, uh, Todd McFarlane interview. I never watched it on YouTube. I just, I listened to it and it was uh, really good. And, uh, he's, he's got me excited for some future ongoing, uh, spawn titles. I got to say that. Yeah. I mean, uh. Gunslinger Spawn back in the old West with Jimmy yeah. Palm. Wally. I know. I know. I may be more excited for that than I ever have been for. Anything I want DC Spawn to let him it have Jonah Hex to make a guest appearance. That would be awesome. <laughs> well, I mean, 
Jimmy's always down to write a Jonah Hex series, and DC's yeah. like, no, it doesn't snow well enough. So yeah. McFarland's like, oh, you want to write a Western? Here you go. So that's yeah, it. really looking forward to that. So uh, anyway, that's going to do it, everybody. Appreciate your support as always. We'll talk to you next time. See you later.